Seeing that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the meeting to order at 6.30. Uh, we're going to review, whoops, we're going to review the agenda uh, with regard to the timing and a few rearrangements of items. Uh, but prior to that, let me also make a few announcements. First of all, in this room on June 10th, we will have a public forum on the capital improvement program. This is per the section 5.7D of the charter. Uh, that will start at 6.30. On June 17th, we will convene again as a town council in this room at 6.30. And on June 18th, we will have a community discussion regarding the proposal for the Valley CDC project for 132 Northampton Road. That will be on June 18th at 6 o'clock at the Bang Center, and more information will be coming out. Um, I briefly want to mention, uh, because they've been wonderful collaborators of ours, that the League of Women Voters is having their annual book sale. It will be on July 26th, 27th, 28th, and August 2nd and 3rd at Fort River Elementary School from 9 to 4, except on the very first day, it will be open till 6 o'clock. In terms of the order of the agenda, uh, we will be here having the hearing for the poll from Eversource, and then the council will, will close that hearing and the council will discuss and vote that. We will then proceed to item, agenda item 7A, uh, which is I'm sorry, it's seven. Seven B, and which is dealing with the water and sewer rates, and then we will proceed with the agenda as follows, including public comment. So, um, since this is the first time that the council has had a public hearing during a council meeting, um, let me just say. I have to declare that we open the hearing on the placement by Eversource of a utility pole on East Pleasant Street. Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 166, Section 22, requires that the council hold a public hearing on the petition of any utility provider to construct or locate poles, conduit, or underground wires for the transmission of electricity. This hearing is on the April second 2019 petition of Eversource to install one solely owned pole approximately 70, 73 feet northerly of the center line of Harlow Drive and 23 feet easterly of the center line of East Pleasant Street as needed for a new transformer. The plan is shown on the screen. If we could please have the, the map. Okay, and you might want to enlarge it for those of us that are going blind. Okay, thank you. Uh, notice of this public hearing was published in the Daily Hampshire Gazette on May 14th, 2019, and is required by statute. Written notice of the time and place of the hearing was mailed by the town clerk on May 13th, 2019, to all owners of real estate abutting the proposed poll location. The Department of Public Works has recommended approval of this petition and reminds the petitioner that a street opening permit must be obtained prior to commencing work. Therefore, we'd like to ask the petitioner to come forward and present. You come to the mics here, you push the button so that you see a green light, state your name and where you're from and proceed. Uh, good evening, Nicholas Langoni, Eversource. So we're petitioning for a poll um, between Harlow Drive and Grantwood Drive on East Pleasant Street going to be a 45-foot pole owned solely by Eversource. Hold on. He is, he, have you not pressed the button in the microphone? You have to be closer. Closer. Uh, thank you. How's that? All yes. right, much better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first timer here. All right, so um, I'll just quickly restate that. So this is for a new 45-foot solely owned pole. Um, between Harlow Drive and Grantwood Drive on East Pleasant Street. 
The purpose of this poll is to relocate a transformer. Um, as part of our grid modernization project, we have installed a recloser on the pole to the north, and that pole had a transformer located on it previously, and we needed to keep that transformer to feed the customers, so we had to relocate it, and the best place to put it was a mid-span pole, um, as shown in the petition. Okay. Any further comments from you at this point? Um, no. Okay. Are there questions from counselors? Seeing none, does the public have any questions? Seeing none, is the public here, is there anybody here from the public to speak in favor of this? Is there anybody here to speak in opposition? Are there any questions from the council? Okay, yes, Andy. I yeah, just want to note that uh, I don't think that the uh, witness needs to will need to respond to this. When I was a member of the select board and regularly did these hearings, one concern that I regularly had was whether the choice of placement of a pole endangered shade trees. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I note that Mr. Mooring, superintendent of public works, sent a memorandum to the council on May 30, in which he responded to that issue and indicated that that uh, is not a problem with the location that's proposed for the poll. So uh, unless there's any other contrary indication, then I will just uh, want to have that for the record. Okay. Yes, Ms. Brewer. Along those lines, I was just going to recommend that since we do these very irregularly, that there somehow be some sort of checklist maintained in with staff, et cetera, to say that we should go ahead and mention that if Mr. Steinberg didn't remember to bring it to our attention, okay. that DPW had, an opinion, had already offered us their opinion. So we knew that because we read our packet, but we didn't announce it as part of the hearing. And I think it is useful, as he just did. OK. Are there any other counselor comments at this time? Okay, then I'm going to declare that the hearing is completed and we will immediately move to a vote. So the following is the motion. I will need a, someone to place the motion and then a second. To adopt the order for a poll location as petitioned by Eversource to install one solely owned poll approximately 73, 73 feet northerly of the center line of Harlow Drive and 23 feet easterly of the center line of East Pleasant Street for the purposes of installing a new transformer as shown on the plan marked 6A822132 and as recommended by the DPW superintendent and to authorize the town council president to execute certification of the council's adoption of the order. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Is there a second? That was Pat DeAngelis. Is there a second? I second it. Dorothy Pam seconded. it. Any further conversation, discussion, questions? All those in favor? Aye. It is unanimous except for one absent. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Are there any opposed? Any abstained? It's unanimous except for one absent. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Okay. okay. Uh, Mr. Bachman, I believe you and Mr. Mooring are going to do the water and sewer rates. Yes, thank you. Um, so in, in your packet is a memo from me to you on the recommendation for water and sewer rates. As you know, under the town charter, the uh, town council serves as the board of water commissioners and the board of sewer commissioners. Uh, the recommendation has been uh, reviewed as part of the budget process, but now you, wearing your hats as board of water commissioners and sewer commissioners, uh, need to vote uh, the actual rate change. The rate change is a modest rate change for both of them, 2.6 percent. The old rate for the water is $3.80 per 100 cubic feet. The new rate is $3.90 per 100 cubic, 
cubic feet, which is a 2.6% increase in water rates. For sewer, the old rate is $3.90. The new rate is $4 per, per 100 cubic feet, which also is a 2.6% uh, rate increase. If you look on page two and on this chart, you will note that we have very low water and sewer rates. Uh, so I think Mr. Steinberg has referenced, you know, people talk about the property taxes in the town. We also, we, you need to also combine that with our relatively low uh, water and sewer rates. And Mr. Boring is here. If there are any questions or uh, concerns, or it's mostly his, it's his department and his work basically on this. Okay. Are there questions from the council? <coughs> I'm sorry, Ms. Brewer. I mean, the, Alyssa. The, I know. There are two copies of this in our uploaded public packet. So I assume the May 31st is the more recent, and so that's the more accurate. Dorothy. I have a question. Um, I think it's great that our rates are so good. Um, and I may have asked you this before, but I don't remember your answer. Why are our rates so better than many other people's rates? So good evening. There's, there's several reasons for that. I mean, if you actually look at the water rates, we're actually kind of in the median of the area. Our water rate is, a, is I mean, we're higher than Greenfield. We're higher than uh, East Hampton. I mean, uh, yeah, East Hampton and Springfield. Um, so in the water side, we're pretty much in the median. Our sewer rate's the one that's a little lower. Um, <clears throat> most of the, this can be attributed to the people who work for your town. The staff at the wastewater treatment plant and the water departments, they work very hard to maintain their systems and keep things running. And we do, haven't had to do a lot of major, major upgrades. We're just now, we do have some on the horizon as our permits come in for water and wastewater. We'll know there's more things we have to change in the plants and there'll be some major upgrades then. But our wastewater plant is over 30 years old and we have not had a major upgrade to the plant. Um, Northampton's wastewater treatment plant is about the same age. When I came here in 1997, we were just completing a major upgrade to that plant. A lot of plants go through upgrades more frequently. It has to do with how well the plants are maintained and how their permits change mostly. Amherst has been lucky in our permits and has been very well staffed and the staff has been able to do a lot of things for the town and keep the prices low. And that's basically the reason. Okay. Other comments or questions? Kathy. We, we started to have a conversation when you were in the Finance Committee about uh, the setting of water rates and the way we can, um, the way we do not have a differential between relatively low users, such as individual residences and large consumers. We have a constant rate. And you, during that, you talked about Northampton has commercial versus residential. But I think it would be uh, good to look at a pot the potential of what would happen if we did it differently. So I'm not necessarily saying we should do it this time around, but maybe look at it in the fall. And what I'm asking about is large users, such as the universities and colleges, where they're using it both for dorms but also for fields. So it may not be a per person use, but a volume use or big apartment buildings, because that will affect the way our permits are set up and also affect the wear and tear on processing plants. So I think it would be useful. So even if our rates on average are fairly good, it would be bring the residential rate down if bulk users paid more. So I just would like to have a, an examination of the pluses and minuses of that, not necessarily saying definitely go that right. So, so that was a comment, but I also, I, I think it would be good to get a little bit more um, justification for two and the actual proposed increases, because you note the expenses are not going up as fast as the rate increases. So just say a little bit more about what the rate increases are in anticipation of. So as we look at our rate increases, the biggest rate increase we have right now, our biggest increase we have in the sewer side is waste disposal. The getting rid of sludge and the process is done, we have two products. We have an effluent water, which is clean and discharged to the river. And then we have a sludge of stuff that has not been eaten by the bugs, dead bugs, non-organic matter, and so forth. We have to get rid of that. That has to be shipped away. It's trucked to, right now, it's trucked to Connecticut. 
So that's our biggest cost we have in the wastewater side. And that goes up pretty substantially. And as fuel prices go up, it fluctuates because you have to put it in a truck and you have to ship it off. Um, there's some changes coming to the market which may help us. Greenfield just talked about an anaerobic digester. If they build their anaerobic digester at their treatment plant, we'll have a disposal site which is closer to us. Is it closer to us? We can actually talk about reducing the, the hauling distance and the hauling cost. If they actually take solid, what we call cake sludge versus liquid sludge, this is probably too much information. And, no. <laughs> and it's not cake you eat. Uh, if we make cake, cake sludge, uh, it's, it's, it's more solids being shipped out versus water being shipped out. So it's more waste you're getting rid of. And that's better for us as well. But there's no place in the area that will take cake. They want it liquid so they can get it off the tankers and process it. So that's one of our biggest price changes is in sludge disposal. Electricity rates always are going up just like in home rates. Um, we pay a different rate because we are an industrial user. We have higher consumption and higher demands. If our lights don't come on, we get a little upset and have to start talking to people and it has to get fixed pretty, pretty quickly. Um, same on the water side. Water side is electricity is our biggest cost. Um, using well number four actually is very expensive as an electricity cost and we've been working to bring those costs down by automating the plant and making it more energy efficient. We installed a variable drive on the well last year and that's brought some costs down and as we actually go through automating the plant we'll be able to fluctuate the plant and make the plant work a little better and more efficiently and that's the thing we're working on next. So electricity is a big cost in water. Chemicals also, we use a little bit of chemicals on the water side and those fluctuate every once in a while. But basically that's kind of where we are. Um, there's not been large uh, salary increases. Um, that's good and bad. If you're on the receiving end of the salary, it's not so great. If you're on the paying end, it's okay. But our salaries have stayed in the market and in the, in the normal range. So we haven't had large rate in, or salary increases. Um, and we've been keeping our costs for uh, medical expenses, our health insurance down as well. Usually our health insurance, because the enterprise systems pay for their health insurance and all their benefits, even the benefits in the post world, uh, it's all included in this rate you're looking at. So those are the things we have to look at. Are there further questions from the council? Yes, George. Given 30-year-old wastewater plant, um, is it reasonable to think that we're probably looking at an, a major upgrade in the next five years? In the next five to ten years, you're looking at a major upgrade, not just from the plant, age of the plant, but from the changes in the permit that's coming. Yes, Evan. So just to, because I don't have the institutional memory here, when, when was the last time that we raised these rates? How often do we do it? Uh, we try to raise the rates every year. We'll raise a water rate, and then raise a sewer rate, or sometimes like this year we're raising both rates. But we try to make small incremental changes to keep pace with inflation, and so we don't have a really, really big rate just for normal operating costs. And just to build off, because that's tied to what George said, um, so in the budget under long range uh, objectives. You mentioned a, a major upgrade of the wastewater treatment plant. There's also a major upgrade of the Centennial water treatment plant. Um, so do you, do we feel as though these modest rates will get us there or is there going to need to be a pretty significant rate or would that just be capital borrowing down the road? So on the water side, we've kind of taken into the fact, into account what we're going to do at Centennial. So even though we haven't designed it, we know a ballpark of where that price tag is. So that was kind of figured into this rate. The wastewater treatment plant, we have a, the field is huge. The ball field is just quite big right now, so we don't have a good handle on how big it is. Uh, we're trying to narrow it down. We're also looking at ways to bring in additional revenue streams into the wastewater side that could help offset the rate increases as well. So we're looking at a bunch of things, but wastewater, we're not really, it's too soon for us to really say on wastewater. Mindy Joe. Um, so I have two things. One goes to rates. This table is helpful, but I'm, I would also like to see, if possible, a table that shows like what our actual rates are compared to other rates. And I don't know whether those are 
you know, instead of average bills, if those are comparable, because some do it per HCF, others do it other, calculate them different ways. So I don't know how easily you can do that. And also what our average use is per year um, compared to other towns, especially residential versus commercial versus farming. Because um, I'm curious whether we have higher uses than others or lower uses than other towns in terms of average water use. And then I was, I was wondering, I think the select board a couple years ago split out a separate metering for farms for sewer use um, so that the irrigation water didn't have to be paid for sewer too. Um, are there other policies out there for things like if a homeowner's water line breaks or an irrigation line breaks and they don't realize it because it's an underground irrigation line until the bill comes, are there policies out there to mitigate those costs um, at any point in time? I know other towns have done that in the past, so I'm, I'm wondering what our town policies might be on things like that. So we can work, in, work on getting those other information for you. That's something we just put together and sent it to you as a packet. Um, our rate is comparable, well, our, Almost everybody in the valley right now uses 100 cubic feet, so it's easy to compare that based on what's going on. Um, our rate we're going up to is on the memo, which is going to be 390 and $4. $390 for water, $4 for sewer. Um, so if you, you can kind of get a good feel that way. But we'll give you the information and put it a little together for you. Um, if you ha feel your water bill is too high because of an accident, um, an accident or some type of issue, uh, you can ask the Public Works Department for an abatement. We typically try not to give an abatement on issues. Um, it's really, it's just like anything else. If you go away for six months and leave your lights on in your house, the electric company is not going to give you your electric bill or break. You left your lights on, you're going to pay the bill. Um, we're having to treat the water. Um, that's something that has a cost to it. Uh, some instances we will, because the water didn't go into the sewer system, if it's a really big break and you turn your basement into a swimming pool or something like that, we'll give you an abatement on the sewer cost. So we'll cut the rate. Basically, your bill gets cut in half. But it's because we're abating the sewer charge, not really abating the fact that you used all that water. Um, we have, in some situations, given a full abatement based on some of the conditions that have happened. But <clears throat> what we find is, is that this is a rental community. The biggest industry here besides education is renting property. Um, education of the, your renters is important and managing your properties is important. And just as it is to keep your, the trash out of your yard and to make sure your uh, people are parking correctly, you should make sure the house is operating correctly. The town of Amherst shouldn't subsidize your rental industry to allow someone to let the water run in a toilet constantly or for people to take showers or to leave the shower or anything else running. You should monitor your, your, your property and make sure it works properly. Um, that's where we have the biggest amount of requests is from mineral properties. Uh, someone, left the, someone left the water running. Someone heard the toilet running and didn't tell anybody. Um, that's not acceptable and that's not what that kind of use we want to encourage. So we tend not to give breaks on that. We might give you one and tell you next time it's all yours. You need to make sure, have a way to keep that from happening. Um, we don't have any irrigation customers yet. We have a policy for irrigation, but after we passed the policy, it started raining. <laughs> so we have, uh, no one has gone into the process of be becoming an irrigation customer. Are there further questions from the council? Yes. So a couple associated with timing. So obviously, many things are new this year. But and in our old form of government, we used to have the budget come out on January 15th. Obviously, these things are related to um, the budget. However, the water and sewer rate used to come out before the budget did. And so we used to do it in early January. And the nice thing about doing it then was that people had six months notice of the increase. There is almost no notice here of the increase. And I realize it's small, but still people do like to be aware of things. So I'm wondering if this is a one-off kind of year, if we're planning to go back to the January schedule, or if we've now decided to have it follow along 
with the other schedule. Um, I think we can take that under advisement. Mr. Bachman? Yeah, no, I think um, because of the, the new council, we did not present this in January when you're, you're forming up. Yes. Uh, we were, you know, we can just present this when the council was prepared, when it's ready. And I think okay. making it part of the budget process makes it a lot more sense as the finance committee is considering the water and sewer budgets, it becomes part of the budget process as well. So, I, but I think early, I think uh, the councilor is correct in that people like it, some advance notice. So if we can do it earlier, we can. Okay, thank you. And also I wanna make note of the request that we at least examine the option of variable rates. Ms. Uh, yes, Alyssa. We have talked about vari uh, variable rates in the past where that has been promoted to us by various members of the public. And so, yeah, figuring out how we might follow up on that would be great. In terms of, again, just, and I appreciate the comment about the notice, but you know, the budget process won't give people much notice on this rate. So we can think about I think we can move that. this just like we do Maybe this. Maybe a little earlier. We can move it earlier, uh, but have it effective July 1. And also just the way we do with the schools, we can take something if we have to out of order. And associated with that, we typically would talk about it one night and we would vote on it at a separate meeting. Okay. And so if we did that, for example, we could do it earlier, right, and then vote on it at the same time as the rest of the budget, for example. So we have choices mm -hmm. like that, but it just gives people a little more notice that okay. way. Also, it gives people the chance, the, the press to have written an article about how your water rate's going up, and then people will come and tell us that as opposed to expecting them to have necessarily mm -hmm. read the packet. The only other thing I wanted to mention is that last year's memo, which you can, of course, find in the select board packet, did include a, a, a rate history from 1977 through the present, and so we could perhaps request that we, ha it won't be the other communities, but we could at least have our rate history published okay. next time we do this memo. All right. Is there a desire to delay the vote on this given public notice to next two weeks from now, or would we like to go ahead? Can I, can I just ask, Lynn, these yes. rates go in effect July 1st? Yes. So, correct. Yeah, so delaying the vote wouldn't give people any advance yeah. notice. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes, Mandy Jo. Although delaying the vote would, as Alyssa said, allow an article to be mentioned in the paper and other notice so that we could get potentially comments from the public on this issue if they have any amount of opinion okay. that they might not have right. noticed it on today's agenda. Okay. So if it's not going to affect when it can go into effect, it might be good to delay it okay. just in case people do have comments. All right. Any further comments on that? Um, Margaret, do I need a motion to delay it or just go ahead and delay it? I, I can just use my right to postpone. Okay. <laughs> Given that we have a councilor who is the right to post, who has raised the right to postpone, it automatically goes to the next agenda. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, moving on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Uh, we're now moving on to public comment, and let me just ask: uh, we are going to have public comment. Actually, we were going to have it on this. Is there anybody here who wants to make public comment on the sewer and water rates? Okay, then we will allow for public comment on that two weeks from now. Um, we are going to have general public comment now. Uh, however, I wanna note that later under item 7A, 7C, 8A, and 8B, we will have public comment. And so if you want to make public comment, it should be on items other than those. Is there anybody here who would like to make public comment at this time? Okay, seeing none, uh, then we're going to move on to proclamations and commemora commemorations. And I would like to call on Pat DeAngelis and Evan Ross for their proclamation with regard to LGBTQ Pride Month. Thank you. Thanks, Great. Uh, so uh, across the country, uh, June is typically celebrated as LGBTQ 
Pride Month. Um, June has a special significance for members of the LGBTQ community um, as the Stonewall Riots occurred June 28th, 1969, uh, which is 50 years ago this month. This is the 50th anniversary. Um, and so many communities, including many of our surrounding communities, issue proclamations to mark the month. Uh, Amherst, to my knowledge, historically has not done so. Um, but I believe it's important to do so in this month to, to recognize uh, the contributions made to our town by our vibrant and diverse LGBTQ community, um, and also to affirm our town's support for that community. And I think that's especially important right now as that community often feels under attack um, from our federal government. Uh, just in the past month, we've seen from the federal administration uh, moves to undo health care protections for the trans community, uh, moves to uh, make it easier for adoption agencies to deny adoption to same-sex couples. Uh, and so I feel like a lot of times in Amherst we feel really insulated from that. This is Massachusetts, right? This is Amherst, like we don't have to worry about that. Um, but I think those of us in the LGBTQ community uh, know that uh, violence against our community anywhere is violence against our community. Um, and that oftentimes when it comes to civil rights, complacency um, can be one of the greatest threats. Uh, and so with the help of Councillor DeAngelis, uh, we've drafted a proclamation to dedicate uh, or to mark or to proclaim, I guess would be the proper, uh, June 2019 as LGBTQ Pride Month to join many of our surrounding communities who have done the same. Uh, and so. Mine is not loading, so Pat, if you would be so kind as to read it. I'm going to make a comment before um, I read the proclamation. Um, I came out when I was 30 years old. Uh, I faced a lot of opposition from my family, from my neighbors, from students of mine who were adults. Um, and I learned that I, in many instances, still needed to hide. Um, Many years later, I met, uh, met a woman, and we've been together for 38 years. Um, we were not allowed to marry. When our son was born, she was not allowed to be on his birth certificate. Um, when he went to school, he had to constantly explain from preschool, uh, kindergarten, first grade, who he was and what we were, what, who we were, not what we were, but who we were, and that he had two moms, and it was normal. And I learned lots of ways to share that information. But every time a new friend of his called our home and said they'd like to come over, we had to have a conversation with their parents. So I want us to also think when, when we read this proclamation that we are talking about family members from the youngest child to grandmothers who are affected by the prejudice against lesbian, gay, queer, transgender people. So I will read it now. Whereas Amherst is a community that values diversity and inclusion and is committed to equal rights and opportunities for all its residents. And whereas Amherst recognizes the important contribution of its LGBTQ residents to the town's history, culture, economy, and civic life. And whereas we celebrate the accomplishments of the LGBTQ community towards securing important rights and freedoms, often through struggle and adversity, and whereas we remain vigilant against continued oppression and discrimination against the LGBT community and against any new political efforts to overturn these accomplishments, and whereas we affirm our support for our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer residents and stand with them to protect their civil rights and ability to live openly without fear. Now, therefore, we, the Town Council of the Town of Amherst, do hereby proclaim June 2019 as LGBTQ Pride Month. I'd like to read the motion and Pat. Uh, to adopt the LGBTQ Pride Month proclamation as presented. So moved. So moved. Second. Thank you. Are there further council conversations or questions, discussion? Okay. Then all those in favor? Yes, Mandy Joe. Thank you for drafting this.
Any further conversations, comments, or questions? Great. All those in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Opposed? N abstain. It is 12-0 with one absent. Thank you. Um, we have one item of presentation for discussion tonight, and I'd like to ask Eric Brody to come forward. And Bill, are you coming forward with him? Thank you. Please introduce yourselves, where you live, and make sure the mic is yes. right up to your mouth. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Eric Brody. <clears throat> I live at 318 Strong Street, and I'm currently chair of the Amherst Public Art Commission. And my name is William Kazin, 32 Goldenrod Circle, and I am the incoming chair of the Public Art Commission. So mostly here for support, but I'll be picking this up where, when Eric okay. steps down. Go ahead, please. All right. I'm coming before you this evening regarding our proposal, our proposed bylaw to establish a percent for art program in the town of Amherst that was passed two years ago last May by town meeting. The vote was 71% in favor. Tonight, I want to A, remind you what the terms were in that bylaw. B, bring you up to date on what's happened with it since its approval two years ago. And C, describe what action I believe the town council now needs to take in its behalf. The bylaw provided, and I think you all have received copies of it for this meeting, that one half of 1% of the total construction costs of any new capital construction project over $100,000 would go to provide some kind of public art at that project site. As you know, the town has four possible projects in mind that would trigger this bylaw for public art. A new elementary school or schools, a new firehouse and DPW garage, and the Jones Library renovation. Further, the bylaw provided that any capital improvement or renovation project over $100,000 would generate one half of 1% of that project's cost to go into an established public art fund that could be used to support public art projects anywhere in town, including support for the performing arts. <clears throat> Finally, the bylaw stipulated that a public art fund would be established in the town's budget which, uh, into which these sequestered monies could be placed and expended as needed as determined by the Public Art Commission in consultation with others. All this is spelled out in detail in the bylaw itself. Because no changes can be made in the town's budget lines without state approval and the bylaw specified a change by adding a public art fund, a special act by the state legislature was requested to authorize this suggested change. The town submitted the bylaw to the House, State House, for its approval of the special act in September of 2017 and it slowly made its way through three committee votes and received approval by the House about a year later in the fall of 2018. It then went to the Senate to undergo the same procedure after which it would go to the governor for signing and finally to the state attorney general for a final sign off and at that point it would become an official valid bylaw. That's my understanding of the process as explained to me by then representative Solomon Goldstein Rose who was extremely helpful in shepherding the bylaw through the house. However, a Department of Revenue attorney on the Senate side raised the concern last October regarding whether it was legal to establish an ongoing public art fund with money that might carry over from year to year given the source of the funds generated by the capital improvement or renovation projects. It's a little complicated to explain in the few minutes I have here, but suffice it to say that this attorney's objections combined with our transitioning to a new form of government here stalled further progress of the bylaw through the legislature and it never made it through the Senate or to the governor's desk. A pretty disappointing outcome, I have to say, after nearly three years of work. 
In a meeting about 10 days ago in the town manager's office with the town manager, the controller, Sonia Aldrich, Lynn Giesmeyer, Andy Steinberg, myself, and Bill Kazin, it was proposed that the best way forward to salvage the Percent for Art bylaw was to strip from it the part relating to capital renovation and improvement projects as potential sources of funding under the bylaw. By doing so, there would be no need for a special act to establish a separate public art fund in the town budget, and thus, no need to go to the state legislature for a special act. The revised bylaw could simply be enacted into town law by the town itself. No state approvals needed. So that's what we're proposing to you here this evening. That you take up this revised bylaw for discussion and then a vote for approval at the appropriate meeting, essentially endorsing the wishes and overwhelming vote by town meeting members two years ago. Members of the Art Commission would be happy to speak to this revised bylaw at your convenience. We feel a certain sense of urgency to have this revised bylaw enacted as soon as possible in order for it to apply to whichever of the town's capital projects is first to be budgeted. With only four projects anticipated in the next decade or two, it would truly be unfortunate if further delays in enacting this bylaw would disqualify any one of those projects from benefiting from public art being included within it. The revision does mean that the bylaw will provide no funding for performing arts, which was very important to some in town meeting and indeed to members of the Public Art Commission. I can only say in that regard that the Public Art Commission will do its best to remedy that by seeking funding sources elsewhere for that purpose. So thank you for your time this evening. And you have in your packets, actually, I had taken the original bylaw and for your convenience to, to read it, stripped from it uh, the portions that I just described so that you, you have a bylaw, how uh, potentially a revised bylaw uh, for your consideration without the public fund um, part to it. Yes, Alyssa. Having struggled to work with this percent for art bylaw for most of those years, although not in the great level of detail that Mr. Brody had to, I would like to be clearer, and, and I really like the explanation, that was very helpful, but I believe that before this body proceeds much further, including any possible referral, is that we need a copy of what town meeting previously passed, specifically marked, to show what's been removed, and before any further work is done on it by council, that, that actual town attorney has actually looked at the revision, because we went through so many iterations of this over the years when we were trying to make it work for the very complex reasons that were discussed. And so I would just not like to see us spin our wheels associated with that, and I appreciate the draft that's been provided us so far. But again, as we look, as, if we are promoting the history of what town meeting did, we should know exactly what they passed and exactly what's being stripped out, and that the town attorney agrees that this will be a whole thing. Okay, Dorothy. Um, I think those are very good suggestions, and uh, Steve, um, once that is done, this would be something good for the Community Resources Committee to spend some time on and then to bring to the full town council. Mandy Jo. So I had a technical question on the lines of Alyssa's, but then I also had a, a different question. Um, technically, would this, as proposed in some sense, it's a repeal and replace in a sense. Um, it could either be amend by stripping out or it could be just a strict repeal and replace because I think we've got something in the bylaws right now. So is, is the technical a revision or are we going for repeal and replace? Mr. Bockelman, did you have a comment on that? So it, it is a, it, I think it would be a repeal and replace because I think there is a bylaw that's been approved um, subject to, oh, it has not been approved, right, right. by the Attorney General. The Attorney General was waiting for yeah. the state legislature to act 
Right, so and um, and so there is no bylaw at this moment in time, right. so it would have to be which is why we sub a, sub a new act by the council, right. which would not have to be reviewed by the state because we are now a city council form of government. Okay, can I yes, ask my Mandy next Jones. question? The next one was about construction projects and what the definition is, and I, kn I know you've talked about the major building projects coming up, but I had some questions, and I don't know whether you could answer them or maybe. Uh, the town manager or someone from his office. Um, the dog park's not being fully funded, so I think that would be excluded from it. But something like the Groff Park renovations um, or any future Mill River renovations um, or even, say, the Station Road Bridge, if it ever becomes permanent, are those types of items that would be included under the definition of construction project? Now that we've stripped out sort of the capital improvement section, I'm trying to get a handle on exactly what construction project means for the purpose of this bylaw. Mr. Bachman. So it depends how you define it. Right now, I believe those, I, the uh, horizontal construction projects are excluded. So, so that is meaning like Groff Park and things like that. Uh, but it depends how you write the bylaw, what it would apply to. You'd have to define mm -hmm. what it would apply to. I might also add that as we went and looked at the zero energy bylaw and moved to the rewrite, there was a whole section added on definitions for exactly this reason. Further comments? Yes, Pat. Uh, a very minor question. Um, it, you're talking about um, uh, the town insuring the works of art, uh, and I'm interested in with the funds for that. Uh, the cost of that be covered by the Art Commission or some other way through the town? Uh, I think the assumption was that the town has insurance policy for uh, existing structures and it would be incorporated into whatever insurance the town currently carries and not be borne by the Art Commission. Thank you. Okay. Further conversation, further questions? Yes. Steve. I'm sorry. I'm Kathy. I thought I saw Steve. Um, I, just, I, I just want to build on um, Mandy's question. I'm reading the bylaw as proposed, the revised, and the first definition under construction project says any capital project paid for in full dot, dot, dot. To construct or remodel any building, decorative, com commemorative structure, park, or any portion thereof within the corporate limits of town. So I don't think it says anything about horizontal versus vertical. You know, I, I think it's a pretty broad definition. I'm not, I'm not saying that's a bad, good or bad thing, but I think there is a definition written into what we're looking at. Um, and then it goes on to say it can be part of a building, attached to the building, outside a building, within a public space, you know, so it's not necessary, you know, so you could get a, a structural that was separate. So we, we have a, a fairly robust definition of what this half a percent would be. Um, and it's things over 100,000. So at least I would take this as an answer because public space includes landscape structures or infrastructure, public parks, plazas, streets, libraries, bridges, stairways, public fountains, and buildings. So we, we've got a, something in front of us that is fairly robust in terms of defining what it's meant to do. I could add one uh, caveat to that that's uh, somewhere it's mentioned in here that it these are projects funded by the town's general fund. There are certain, like enterprise funds don't qualify, so there are certain um, projects that wouldn't qualify um, just by definition. And I think the wording is eligible projects. And uh, like the, the, there are certain uh, funding projects through the enterprise funds that um, make those certain projects not eligible. So the sewer plant doesn't necessarily right. have to have a statue on it, no. or, but we might, <laughs> we might want to decorate it. Exactly. <laughs> Andy. So, uh, just Brody knows I've spent a lot of time with him um, on the original proposal in all stages described. The one thing that I just want to clarify it's just a minor point, but it's still a clarification. And that is that it was not a Senate De Department of Revenue um, attorney. Uh, the Senate Council's office referred it 
to the Department of Revenue. The Department of Revenue provided a response to Senate Council, and based upon that, Senate Council did not recommend to the Senate that they go forward in a timely manner to get it completed before the end of the last session. Uh, but it was actually a DOR attorney, not a Senate attorney. Uh, the second thing is that uh, I have looked at the Cambridge bylaw and discussed this at the meeting that was referred to in the memo. Cambridge is the one that uh, has an operating bylaw that we can really look on into and say, hey, that works because we know it's worked in that community. Uh, what is being proposed as drafted has some significant differences from the way that the Cambridge bylaw is structured. So I would be a little bit hesitant uh, from my role of having been involved with this for some time to recommend it until we take a really close look because I don't think that what we got in the bylaw exactly coincides with uh, the provision that was even described in the remarks. And uh, I think it would be worth moving forward. What's most important to me, and I think that Mr. Brody touched on it, is that if we're serious about this, and I think there, there are very important reasons to be serious about this, knowing that we have four major construction projects, that whatever process we use, we need to get that process moving. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, we're, uh, if we spend, if we're going to have to spend a little bit of time trying to figure out what's the best and the most appropriate wording for us to use, whether it be the approach Cambridge has taken or something entirely different, uh, I don't think that we serve the goals of town meeting in delaying this. And the one thing that I regret is that Mr. Brody didn't do something he did very eloquently at town meeting. I don't think I could ever match his eloquence on the subject, and that is to tell us why public art is important to this community. But uh, that was the point of the whole thing, is that uh, when we do new buildings, as has been done in other communities, not just Cambridge, public art is um, as important an element as good architecture and good landscaping. So uh, I think that was, if I if misstated you in any way by being too quick about it, you can supplement, so thank you. Any further conversation on this? I'd like to sum, yes, go ahead, Darcy. I, I'd just like to say here, here to Andy's comments and that I'm, I'm sorry that your initial efforts weren't fruitful, but I'm really happy that you're persisting, and um, I will be supporting it all the way. Thank you. I appreciate that. So we are not voting on this tonight. In fact, if anything, it would be referred. Uh, one ob obvious option is the CRC committee. I want to turn to Andy and say, do you feel like, because of the financial implications, it also needs to go to finance? I think that it probably would make sense for it to go to finance um, just so that we can comment on the amount of money and the funding and the effect on funding sources that would um, be there uh, and provide that information. Uh, and as I said, <laughs> since I'm also on CRC, uh, I would like, uh, I just hope we can. Uh, move this along so that we can get the discussion uh, proceeding. In addition to that, uh, Alyssa stated that we need to look at the previous bylaw and its intent, and also uh, at some point when we feel we have the right draft, to have this reviewed by town attorney. Okay? So um, we can do, yes. I would just state that if it does get referred to CRC or finance with a positive recommendation, then it automatically, under the rules, then goes to GOL before it comes back to the council. But Thank that's you. an automatic okay. once those recommendations are done. Now you've gone through three committees. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. Um, is there any, so the question at this point is whether or not we want to move based on additional information being provided for referral to CRC and to finance uh, in a manner that they would, you know, report back to us no later than, I don't know, middle of July. Um, I have a, a question. I mean, New York City has had one of these laws. I don't know the details for many years. And um, I, I think that it might take a little bit of time to do research in Cambridge and New York City to see how they do it. Um, I would say that we do have to be very careful about vandalism-free art, which is, um, I remember there was a beautiful piece of work put up in front of the college where I was teaching in, in the Bronx, and it lasted a week. Uh, so they came up with a different project, which was safe from vandals, casual vandalism. I, th I just think we have to be concerned with that. Okay. Steve? So what I, the intent here is to basically take the discussions that happened at town meeting and basically repackage it and hopefully approve it through the town council. It, so I'm wondering that rather than kind of relitigating, because all of these discussions have have happened, and it's a new, and many of us were on town meeting when they happened. I was wondering if we could maybe even find the clips of town meeting in which you were so, you know, eloquent and have that as sort of background information so, so that those who are interested really know what the discussion was because of so much of this was, uh, you know, discussed thoroughly. Okay, so there's two pieces of information, the clips from town meeting and the actual previous bylaw that was passed by town meeting. Okay, as background. But the question really is on the issue of referral. And the, again, keeping in mind, and the reason I'm pushing on the time, and it can slip a little bit, but um, is our goal as a council is to move forward with the um, development of a comprehensive capital plan this fall and this clearly would be part of looking at that. Mandy Joe. So I would support the standard 45 days that are in the rules we just adopted. That report if CRC, and I would support referral to both CRC and FinCom. Um, if neither of them or one of them aren't done in 45 days, the report can be, hey, we're still working on it. Um, we'll get back in another two weeks and all. It doesn't, you know, but that 45 days gives a, timeline of this is when we'd like to at least know what the status is. And while I'm talking, Dorothy, um, and, and for the two of you, Philadelphia also has one. Okay. Is there, um, are you prepared to make a motion? Sure, I'm always happy to make motions. Excellent. I move to refer the percent for art bylaw proposal um, to the CRC and finance committees for reporting back in 45 days. Is there I, a second? I second that motion. Dorothy seconded it. Yes, Steve. So I have a question about the order. So we're sure. going to have a town attorney review of this ahead of time, yes? Or no? um, it's, Margaret, do you have a, or Paul, do you have a, a suggestion as to when we would have them review this now or after it's been reviewed by both committees? Probably both. Okay. I have a drafter, have them look at the draft that okay. to submit it, and then after right. the council, the council committees look at it. Okay, thank you. So the answer is now and then f when we have a final one. Okay. Any further questions? There's a motion and it's been seconded. Any further conversation? I have a question. Yes. At what point in this process would the Art Commission be involved? I think at the point that you would meet with both of those two committees when they're meeting. Right. Okay. Further conversation? Yes, George? I'm just weird to mention that in this referral before these two committees, um, this bylaw may go through some changes in That's, conversation and so forth. Yeah. And so you have two different bodies looking at it and who's going to sort of make sure that it's the same bylaw that uh, both of them are looking at, and uh, so it comes to us. Um, okay. 
I'm just wondering why there. it wouldn't come to us first, and then it would go to you for the, the sort of comments on it. It sounds like you're going to be engaged in a process of back and forth, trying to shape the bylaw, um, and then eventually it comes back to us. Meaning GOL. Yeah, but does anyone have this problem that I'm having, that uh, it's not quite clear what, I mean, you're, you'll be all looking at the same document, but then it'll get changed in one committee, and then it'll go to the other committee, and then you. There is some overlap in the committees. Yeah. At I least. prefer that they actually have a document that you're both looking at, and mm -hmm. you make comments on its implications for, you know, economic or whatever, but uh, it sounds like you're actually going to be engaged in some sort of back and forth as to how to shape this bylaw and make changes to it. Mandy is that Chair. correct? So the only committee I'm on is GOL, but my thinking in referring to both was that CRC would take the lead with the Public Art Commission to come up with the actual draft of the bylaw, that finance would look at the financial implications of whatever that final draft is, and once that final, maybe that goes back to CRC at some point, depending on what that language is and what their thoughts are, once it's out of both of those committees with a final wording, then it comes to GOL automatically, because GOL should not touch it until it's gotten its final wording. Okay. Further comments on that as a process? I don't think we need to vote yes, Dorsey. And then it comes back to the full council. Yes, it does. As, and it has to be to, before the council for two meetings, okay. that since makes, it's a bylaw. That makes sense to me, too. CRC, finance, GOL, <laughs> council. <laughs> You got it. All these times that you've been sitting back there, William, you've gotten it. I've got the acronyms down. Yeah. Okay. Is there any further question before we vote? Then I call the question. And Mar Margaret, would you please read the motion back to us? The motion is to refer the percent for our bylaw proposal to the Community Resources Committee and the Finance Committee for reporting back to the council in 45 days. Okay, the motion's been made and second. Call the question. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? It's 12-0 and one absent. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I just want to make note, we're still on time. Oh, God. And we're going to move on to the budget. So this, you have had before you since May 1st a budget proposed by the town manager. And that budget then was referred to the finance committee. And the finance committee has met no less than two times a week for sometimes as much as three hours and many of those meetings have been done jointly with the full council and several of you participating in what have been incredibly informative meetings. Um, the Finance Committee has since prepared a report, and I would just want to say that Andy Steinberg has done that with advice from members of the Finance Committee, and it really sets a precedent for this being the first time that this is how a budget comes back to a legislative body in this way. Up until now, it's always been the budget goes to town meeting. Well, this time it's coming to town council. So if you have not read that document, I please strongly urge you to do so, since this is one of at least two and maybe eventually three nights that we will be discussing the budget. Um, so tonight, um, we're going to just go through the various uh, parts of this. Andy's going to talk about it as well. But with both um, Margaret and Sonia and our lawyers, they have pulled together the various uh, parts of this. And let me just say that tonight we are not going to vote on all of it. In fact, if you don't want to vote on any of it, we can delay. But there's three areas in which we actually have no reason not to go forward unless there are overwhelming questions. The first one is on the general operating budget, which is um, appropriation and transfer order FY2004, and it's part A, B, I'm sorry, part B. 
And that includes all kinds of different things, and we will review those and make sure your questions are answered. Meantime, Sonia's coming forward. The second area, the second one, Part C, is actually not something we will vote on tonight because it's on capital, and we would not want to vote on that until after we have the public forum. The third part is actually, um, it's an, it's, it's basically housekeeping, and Sonia is much better at explaining these kinds of things, uh, but it's basically taking care of previous appropriations uh, and rescinding an, on, an, uh, an authorized but unused bond, unissued bond, excuse me. Part D is the Community Preservation Act, and I would suggest that we're going to hold off on voting that, on that until the 17th, and even with that, there's one exception, and that is the Finance Committee has asked to hold off on the vote regarding the Valley CDC until after the forum on the 18th. The Finance Committee will be meeting on the 25th of June to then forward a recommendation to the Council. And then finally, the uh, final one is on the... Um, transfer order and tax exemption. And that's one, after we have discussion tonight, we may be ready to move forward. However, before we start, I'd like to turn it over to Andy and have him as Chair of Finance uh, offer comments. Okay, thank you. And I am going to be fairly brief because I think, uh, we've spent a lot of time on the budget already and hopefully have had an opportunity to review the report that was provided by the Finance Committee after its extensive um, time reviewing each section. I, looking at it from sort of the, um, you know, thousand foot view down is, uh, and taking the bigger view and not getting into the details and on everything because that would be impossible. It, it is a balanced budget. Um, and by balanced, I mean that revenues and expenses balance each other. It was not easy getting there. I think that's one thing that um, I, we didn't really recognize or have to talk about because the hard work on that was actually already done by uh, town manager and, and uh, with Ms. Aldrich's uh, assistance to try and figure things out and come up with solutions early in the process when the first uh, first take on the budget was done in the first projections, it was not in balance. And uh, I think that we should recognize that. Um, there were a couple of things that really helped, or three things that probably really helped. One was when we got the health insurance rates and that they were substantially uh, lower with less than a 1% increase than we might have feared and we were able to uh, discontinue some payments for, that we thought might be due from prior year's health coverage. So that was one piece of great news. The state aid uh, budget came in. I think this, it, it came in in an amount that was uh, at least helpful to us to get to the end result. And then the last thing was that um, if you look closely, there's $300,000 that's being proposed to be used from what's called the overlay surplus account uh, that um, helps to balance this budget. And uh, the important thing that we should remember is that uh, the $300,000 uh, from overlay surplus is not going to be available every year. Um, and uh, But it is available this year, and it is a sound decision to use it. Uh, the, um, there were some things that happened this year that um, were uh, significant in addition, one of which was that uh, because Hadley discontinued its contractual arrangement with Amherst to provide um, ambulance service, we lost both the money from the contract and we lost the billing that goes with it. Uh, billing, uh, meaning patient billing for health insurance or Medicare, whoever might pay for the transport. Uh, 
that is actually a permanent loss. Uh, we did not do any adjustment in the staffing of the fire department, and uh, there were solid reasons to not make any adjustment in the staffing of the uh, fire department. So we lost money from the revenue side and did not affect the um, expenditure side. So those are the major points that I um, wanted to start with. The budget was um, had a primary goal, and that primary goal was to continue current programs that are provided by the town through um, the three parts that are funded in the operating budget, town municipal departments, the schools, and the library. And uh, in doing that, uh, we were recognizing that these are the services that people expect from our town and uh, that maintaining the services that people expect and value was um, what the manager was recommending to us in the finance committee is making that recommendation to you in saying that we concur with the town manager's budget recommendation. Uh, we know that there were still stresses within departments as we met with each department. I think that um, as you read our, the finance committee report and the uh, short sections we put in describing each department, there was frequently statements made by various departments about um, we're not sure or we know that the staffing is really inadequate. We understand that you can't do anything about that, but um, we, if we had to do anything, it would be to add more staffing. Uh, and so that was a significant uh, recognition on our part that um, it was a, a, a budget that we couldn't do more to add um, for our departments, but we needed to get a responsible balanced budget, and that is what the manager had offered to us. So I think that that is probably where I'm going to stop with my introduction, and uh, between the manager's budget and all of the information that you've received since then, and with the Finance Committee report, uh, I think probably you should just open it up for questions. So we're going to, excuse me, we're going to look at this, and it's a little blurry, but you have your own copies as well. Uh, we're going to look at this in regard to Part B, which is the Appropriation and Transfer Order FY2004. And it is in your document on page 10 and 11 of the document entitled Town Council Finance Committee Recommendations on fiscal year 2020 budget. It's also in that separate item of packets of which you're seeing the second page up here. And Sonia, if you would just review for us what is in this part of the budget and then have people ask questions. And we're gonna just stick to this one for the time being. Okay, so um, instead of doing this on all separate votes like we used to at town meeting, we um, put it all together as one. And if you look at the first three, retirement assessment, the regional lockup assessment, and the OPEM, that was usually on the consent calendar, so it was all voted at once. I know people used to pull out the OPEM and ask a lot of questions about the OPEM, but it used to be just one vote that would go through. The rest is the operating budget, and it used to be listed separately by um, town, the town operating budget was by functional area. We voted each number. We just put this as a total here. Um, library services, elementary schools, debt service, that was all part of the budget article at town meeting. Um, like I said, the only difference here is that we put the total at the bottom. You can still discuss each line item. You can still have questions on this. It's I, I added the funding sources for this, so it's clear where the appropriations are coming from. I really don't know what else to add to that. And then the final yes. one is actually the enterprise fund. Right, and that used to be part of the budget right. in the okay. town so meeting articles. Are there questions? 
let's just start with the top three that are really relate to our retirement funds. Are there questions on that? Andy. Just to clear, regional lockup is not actually related to retirement funds. Okay. Regional you. lockup yeah, right. is um, an agreement that we have with uh, the sheriff's department, I believe, is that um, they run a regional lockup that the police department can use, which is a more cost effective method than um, trying to staff um, a similar detention facility of our own um, when it's um, needed. Thank you for that clarification. I kept looking at that and going, I don't think that's retirement. Uh, so are there any questions on the first three items? Yes. Well, I, I had a question when we went over this at a previous meeting uh, about fully funding or movement towards fully funding um, the pension system. And I believe you said that you were working towards that or moving towards that. I'm just what if you could clarify that? Um, for our retirement, fully funding our retirement, I think it's um, slated to be fully funded in 2033 through the retirement board. We, we do pay more than would be the annual amount right. to try to catch up. And this is um, the general funds portion of the retirement. Right. It's the actual retirement is about 6.5 million, but the enterprise funds pay their portion. And we get a discount if we pay it all up front of 2%, I think. I, I'm not sure about the percentage, but I know it's about 117,000 that we save by paying it, so. Okay, all right. Other questions on this portion? Okay, then moving to general operating. This is the town's operating If you budget. want to see a breakdown of that 24 million, it's on page 12 of the budget book. There's a chart there that has all the departments and what the amounts are, and it totals to the 24 million, if I did it right. Yes, Shalini. So I had a question about the community services. Uh, community services. I had a question about that. That's part of the operating budget, right? Is that okay to ask that right now? I didn't hear the second word. Community. Oh, sorry. Community services. Community and, services. Yes. Okay. Mr. Bachman or. Uh, yeah, you probably know. You've actually highlighted it, and uh, it's the the figure of sixty thousand dollars that's been removed this year from. Uh, this was for youth programs uh, last year, and we've removed it this year. And Paul uh, actually raised that as a question for us as a town council to discuss how we would like to go about. Uh, you know, what are our goals for social services? And I just wanted to share what Darcy and I have been hearing in our district specifically, uh, especially relates to uh, children having access to leisure services programs and after school programs. And you know, and I would highly recommend that if you could find a way to not to make sure that every child has access to these after school programs and leisure. I mean, that's one commitment I'm hoping we can make as a town council is that no child is left behind in these programs. So, yes, so, so I Martin. think that is a goal. Thank you. Um, that is the goal of LSSE. And because of the 60,000, we do have funds to make sure that that's the case this year. Um, in terms of future years, uh, we would probably have them reprioritize some of their funding to make sure that it can be done. But whether um, the reason uh, I recommend, I didn't include it in the budget is because we would have had to cut something else and I didn't wasn't prepared to do that. And I also wanted to uh, have that conversation, a more uh, open uh, com conversation with the full town council to say, where do you, how much do you want to invest in um, community services? And then uh, give me guidance on, on how you want that to be done. That would be part of the goal setting process, I would guess. But we do not need to make that decision to pass this amount? No. OK. Uh, Evan. Yeah. So Building on that, I think that 
the two numbers that jumped out to me as sort of concerning, for lack of a better word, was the 60,000 in community services and then also the 53,000 uh, from transportation. I understand those were one-time appropriations um, and I, and, uh, that were made by town meeting. But I, I guess I'm just curious, um, when you make a one-time appropriation, you know, what happens when that's taken away? Mm -hmm. um, what, is that, what does that look like for the departments that actually receive that appropriation? And were they um, expecting that that would be a one-time thing? Or, or had they made changes un with an understanding that once you get that, then you level fund from there? So they understood that this money was coming basically out of our savings account, that it wasn't a recurring source of revenue to support these two, those two activities. So I think they, on both of them, they understood that this was a, and uh, it was a one-time thing, um, but it was concerning because they worried, and the PVTA said this explicitly, is that they worry about setting up expectations and then not having, is the town gonna promise funds every year so we can continue that? And that's, um, that was there, was one of the PVTA's concerns was, yes, you can do it once summer, but what, what about next summer? And that was something we did not address. Can I continue? Yes, sir. And so I think that just um, as a council, this was something I hadn't really thought about before, but trying to avoid these types of, I mean, obviously we don't have as, well, we can't increase, we can't do a town meeting, did, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, but working with you, um, to make sure that funding is sort of sustainable. Because my first thought was, I understand why we're not keeping that 60,000 in. And then my second thought was, wow, what a, t what, we let, I'm trying not to curse. Um, you know, that, that's unfortunate for a department to receive an influx of cash and then have it be for one year and have to all of a sudden use it. Um, so my hope is that, I mean, didn't see anything in this budget that would, re that would seem like next year there's gonna be a dramatic cut, um, but hopefully that's something that we avoid going forward as a town, just these one-offs. Mm -hmm. Andy. This might be helpful. There actually were three different actions that um, I think have been touched on in this conversation several years ago, and I think at least three. Um, it was probably uh, the year before you were here, Mr. Bauckham, and uh, there was an um, initiative at town meeting to increase um, the funding for LSSE. And that actually is where a lot of the, um, really all of the money comes from for the um, tuition assistance for after school programs and uh, for camp programs. If I'm wrong, um, please correct me. Uh, but that was actually then built into the budget so that it was a continuing, um, it became a continuing commitment and therefore is built into this budget because mm -hmm. you did not remove it um, from last year. There were some additional one-time uh, votes that were for uh, not specified programs. One was used with, um, for a nutrition program mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what we did with the last round. You'd have to know that better than me at this point. Uh, but there were really three separate ones for the, on that score. And as far as the transportation one, uh, and this gets back to what Evan was saying, the uh, select board actually um, advised town meeting against it for the very reason stated. Um, it used half of the money from the transportation enterprise fund balance and to make a one-time expenditure of a transfer from fund balance that expended half of the fund balance for a specific pur purpose was a matter that uh, I was concerned about, um, other members of the select board were concerned about, but town meeting um, did proceed to make that vote nonetheless. and. Um, that's the other item that was been referenced. Hey, Pat. <laughs> I'm uh, looking back at town meeting and seeing Joel, Jim Olden standing up and uh, talking about increases to the social services funds. And uh, I think we really need as a council and a town 
to really think about what our prior priorities are in terms of resident needs. Um, okay. Hi, Dorothy. Um, on Saturday, I went to two um, community events uh, with community particip participation officer Jennifer uh, Moylston. And I thought she said to me that any child in Amherst who wanted to go to a summer program who needed a scholarship could get it. And she also mentioned that there was going to be the uh, meals, I don't remember the name of it, the, the meal truck coming to the playgrounds. And it sounded as if it was really a strong program this summer. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused about where we are. Um, the, the events were lovely. It was really great, and people had a good time. And it was it was very nice to see uh, North Village and also at Butternut Farms. Mm -hmm. They're very nice events. Mm -hmm. So, I wondering if you could clarify that. Yeah. So this summer, uh, students will have the ability. Any student uh, will be able to attend any summer program, and also they they receive some grant funding to make sure that the meals are available at all the different recreational sites. So I think we're set for this summer. We're, we'll be fine. Alyssa. Just to add a little more context, as some other people have been doing, so the meal program's not coming out of the town budget, so mm -hmm. that's other programming that some of us have been to meetings associated with, and it's very new. It's only been a couple, been doing it a couple of years. It'll be wonderful if it continues, but like other grant-funded programs, things don't always stay. And so LSSE has been really important in coordinating that to ensure that it gets to all the people that we would want it to get to. In terms of the social services commitment that town meeting has expressed over the years, as well as has been expressed by the select board in their various policy statements, et cetera, we do need to have, as the town manager indicated, another conversation. We set up a special topic for that at a select board meeting prior to a fall town meeting, and it didn't get a particular lot of interest from people because what had started happening traditionally at town meeting was people just started lumping in some extra money. as. Evan pointed out, we can't do that under our new form of government. So we do need to think it through ahead of time so that we aren't questioning after the fact when it's too late to change the amount. While for several years now, we have been working really hard to ensure that students do all have access to all programming they might desire to participate in, that has not traditionally been true. We have, in fact, always traditionally funded some scholarship money, but that scholarship money often decreased when budgets got tight. And so for many years, we were not funding every child who wanted to participate. And for the last several years, we have been, which is really exciting to see. But it does mean, obviously, not only is it somewhat unpredictable, but it also involves a lot of outreach. And it also involves ensuring that people know it's available, which is, again, the outreach part, because otherwise people give up and they don't attempt to participate. So people have recognized those frustrations for many years at town meeting, and that's why often at town meeting some money got lumped in for extra. The most recent times it got lumped in it was when town meeting, and the reason I say lumped in is because as we would have to explain from the front of the room on a regular basis is that town meeting could not control how that money got spent. They could send it to the community services budget, but they could not decide how it was going to get spent. That was something that was worked out with staff afterwards. So that, again, just brings us back to this whole idea of setting up our priorities with a good conversation well before the town manager has to create the budget with his departments in order to be able to do that. Because the, one of the more recent times was associated with block grant funding. And as some of you are aware, yeah. only five social service agencies can be funded. That's the maximum allowed by the state. So people at town meeting said, but what about those other two groups? Let's give them the money. That's not where the money went. So the money got voted, but that's not where the money went because that process wasn't the what process we used. So we have a different process now that I think is good in that it forces us to coordinate ahead of time rather right. than trying to just right. tack things on at the end. And, and this year we begin that budget discussion actually next month. <laughs> Aren't you excited? Um, Mark Darcy. Um, could you just clarify where the, the $60,000 did get spent? I know it's, on, it's getting spent on youth services, um, some at Groff Park. So if you could just this, clarify. For this year? So, yeah, so one of the things is to have enhanced programming at the new Groff Park, uh, and the other is to support uh, tuition so people, everybody can participate, any child can participate in the, um, uh, the summer programs. It's, if we're able to make that work, really work. 
So that that's how we're handling those that source of funds. The second piece is through LSSE? And the schools. Thank you. Further, yes, Mandy Jo. So I'll stick on this. I'd like, I, I read in the budget, both for mainly community services, but also library services, and I know we're not on library services, that the increase in minimum wage has really affected particularly those two budgets. Can you talk about um, the ongoing effects of that, at least as it relates to community services, and, and what, how you're managing mm -hmm. that? So that's something that we had not budgeted previously, the, the projected increase in, in minimum wage, and the, the departments were absorbing that increase. This year we did recognize that, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but Sonia might be finding them. We did increase, especially the library and LSSC's budgets, to recognize that they were um, paying more per hour because of the increase in, in minimum wage, and that we wanted to be, be doing that. that was, and we didn't want them to be their, have their programs be hurt because of that. So that is in the budget this year for those two departments especially. Yeah. We, did, we did increase um, Cherry Hill and Leisure Services, 13,000, 10 for Leisure Services and three for Cherry Hill. The library is a different budget. Yeah. yeah. Further questions on the town operating budget? If not, we'll move on to the, I'm sorry? Yes, Evan. Um, I had a question about the, I guess this also relates a little bit to the library, but the shared maintenance manager mm -hmm. um, position. It, it seems like a lot of responsibility was added and only 0.27 FTE. I'm wondering if, if there's a feeling that uh, all of those additional responsibilities are adequately captured in that point too. So, I mean, I don't know if this person is having to also go to like JCPC meetings and, or whatnot. Um, if if point two seven is sufficient to encompass all of those additional um, responsibilities, or if there's a thought that in the future that might have to be bumped up. So, so the agreement we have with the library director is is that we would take some time of their person who is in charge of, of, um, main, of facilities because he is a higher level person and then we would utilize him for some of our, so managing our, our buildings. Not necessarily the major capital projects, which is what the previous facilities manager did, which was a much higher level. So this is a managing people level position. And it, in exchange for that, they were able to hire, we gave them enough money or they were able to have access to enough funds to hire additional um, staff at the library just for cleaning services, which was this maintenance manager was actually doing some cleaning as well. So we elevated him to be able to manage people across both organizations, both the um, library and the town. And so he's much more of a, a, a manager. George Hicks, you may have met him or not. Uh, I'm not sure if he came he, into your committee meeting or not. Um, so he, but he's not expected to do as much FaceTime with um, the finance committee and things like that other than his particular projects. Um, does that make sense? Further questions on general operating? Yes, Mandy Joe. So thank you for, first of all, I sent you a number of questions last week, and so thank you for answering them. Um, I'm going to refer to one of those, which was my tree and ground question, which came from page 80, in case people are curious. But um, that was the maintenance of the ball fields yes. and, and all. Um, what is the plan going forward? I know things have changed in the last year or so in terms of what you mentioned in your answer about auditorium use now that we're not really using it and all. Mm -hmm. What's the plan for coordinating the receipts or the offsets for the fact that the town's tree and grounds are currently maintaining not just elementary school budget, what I would think of as budget areas, mm -hmm. but also regional school budget, which is something that three other towns maybe should be chipping in for. Mm -hmm. um, so could you talk about sure. the plan for re-looking at that? So this has become a, a m very popular topic lately and <laughs> has been at, on the, uh, at the school committee last week and will be again on their agenda on July 11th. Uh, they have an athletic director who's the sort of point person for that. Um, we've identified um, two major things. One, one is the, the condition of the fields themselves and then the management of the fields. And so it's the maintenance of the fields and the management of the fields. So we, had, we actually had a pretty comprehensive meeting this morning to um, identify the short-term 
issues that need to be addressed, the medium-term issues that need to be addressed, and then the long-term issues, uh, which uh, came out. I didn't bring it. Um, there's a, a report that Weston Sampson has issued that's uh, on the town's website, I believe, um, that talks about the long term. And there's still, it's a still a draft form, so they are revising it. Um, a lot of the relationship between the town and the schools and the regional schools has been kind of a handshake shake agreement. There's not, it's not quantified in any way. Uh, the town in the L has certain responsibilities, and they, we are staffed to handle those responsibilities. The schools provide a certain amount of um, uh, seed and fertilizer and things like that. That comes out of their budget. Um, it's, it's, I think because everything was under one facilities director at one point, uh, Ron Bohanowitz, that he sort of managed it himself and sort of had a sense. And, you know, I asked this morning, does anybody feel like they're not getting a good deal out of this between public works and, and the schools? And they both felt that it was kind of equal, but it's not quantified in any way. We don't quantify how many hours our people spend on fields because it, it varies, depends on weather, things like that. Um, but we are looking at how all those services are provided. Uh, and the two big things are the fields are not built really well. Um, the origin of the fields is they were generally um, farm fields, and they, but people didn't really farm in Amherst because it's not great soil for it. So there's a lot of clay, it retains water. Um, and when we built fields, we just sort of built fields over farm fields. And, uh, other than Plum Brook, there weren't really extensive uh, irrigation or um, drainage that was in, in, uh, installed into the fields. The other piece is the maintenance, that fields get used, fields need to rest, and there's not a clear hierarchy of decision making in terms of who can say no to field use. And that's been identified as a major issue um, that we need to address, and we've talked about who, could be, who would be at a level high enough to be able to say, no, you can't use the fields, um, or yes, you, the fields are available for use based on their conditions. Um, so we, we've, we're having that conversation, recognizing, working with the schools and Public Works and LSSE, who are all the players in this, in this um, uh, situation. And I, I think the biggest thing is going to be, um, at some point, someone's going to say no to someone who wants to have a tournament or a game or, or important game and it's going to say the field isn't usable and then there's pe people have to respect that the, whoever that person whoever is empowered with saying that is going to be backed up by the leadership of both the town and the schools to say yes they have the right to say no because the field the field conditions are important so we're, those conversations maintenance and management are both recognized as being things that need to be addressed and that's where the conversation is moving and i think the athletic director um is moving, to, going to have that a little bit more comprehensive conversation with the uh, school committee on July 11th. Okay, Dorothy. Um, when you said fields need to rest, yes. Um, in farming, you do that. You yeah. rotate and you rest them. Do you have enough fields so you can say this year this field is not being used? We're letting it regenerate, or maybe doing some work on it. Um, we. So when you redo a field, it needs at least a year, maybe two, to just have the, the roots take hold. And we don't, the fields in Amherst are um, very well used, and they're being used more and more. And there's also, we've talked about equity issues between boys' teams and girls' teams, and who has access to fields. Um, so they're used, um, the report has some, some details about the intensity of use, and they do get used intensively. and. Um, and then what happens is we have sort of pirates who just go to come on and sort of have an event or, or have field, be, use the fields without anybody scheduling them or knowing them, knowing what's going on with them. So we, what the best solution from our perspective is not the creation of new fields, which used to be the solution, but to create fields that can be used more intensively. Typically that is, means artificial turf because that is the thing that's uh, easiest to use year round, and there's, it's usually not a water issue, which we suffer a lot from in this town. In the last couple of years, we've had um, severe drought, and the fields have suffered because of it, and then we've had severe wet weather, and the fields have suffered because of it. So we know what both of them look like, and it's pretty easy. 
Um, we're also looking at establishing a protocol for when fields are taking offline, like just very clear things like if there are puddles on the field, no play on it. And just so everybody knows what it looks like and we're more transparent. We're also looking at a shared calendar that's available to the public that everybody can see when fields are being scheduled. Uh, things happen a lot at the last minute because it might rain and then you think you have a game on Sunday, you think some people might say, yeah, it's good enough to, to, to play on, but others might say, no, it's not. So it's a complex thing, but it's, it's becoming, uh, because of our experience over the last two years, it's not just this spring, it's been, over, it's been growing over a number of years. Last fall, if you recall, uh, soccer teams were being questioned whether we could actually host home games on our soccer field and whether we could have uh, events, and that's become something that is a concern for the school district as well. Further, yes, can I see? Do do we um, have arrangements where either Amherst College or UMass will be our alternative fields? So, so we we are using their fields now uh, because once you know come, once the first of May comes around, they're very generous with their fields. <laughs> uh, before that, they're not, and because this class is in session, um, and it depends on who we talk to at the uh, different institutions. Um, and it's also something that we're talking with the university about and want to talk with the college about as well in terms of what we should expect from them. We'd like it to be reliable. What's happening now is that they're very flexible, but they don't give us advanced time because they need to make sure that their customers in the university are serviced first, and then they'll say, well, you can use the field. That doesn't give us a lot of comfort when we're utilizing your fields. But right now, uh, the university especially ha has uh, saved, in essence, the, the fields for our spring sports. I just build on that connection also, there's a sports management um, a degree you can get at UMass, and there are people that I assume work with athletic fields. Mm -hmm. Are there ways we could, uh, when we're doing a re redesigning and major construction, pull on less expensive resources, whether they're the design firms versus a Weston Sampson that I know is a big name, but uh, pull on community volunteers looking for ways that we could get community involved in, in helping or the university involved in a contribution of graduate students and professors and thinking through solutions to some of the how to fix problems. So we have graduates of, of the turf management program on our staff and they're the ones who are in charge of managing the, the turf and they do a really great job. It's what I'm, my first, my first comments is the fields themselves don't start great and that's one of the challenges. So you can aerate it, you can do all the things that you need uh, unless you take them offline and recondition them in a pretty serious way um, no matter how, you know, what, whatever source resources. But we have a person on our DPW staff who has graduated the turf management program really knows the stuff uh, and is trusted by everybody, uh, but the <laughs> conditions of the fields just don't lend themselves to being easily rehabilitated without taking them offline and putting a lot of money into them. The estimate is about $25,000 per field that you're supposed to be spending on them, and we're not spending that kind of money on each of our fields per year. Okay. Are there further conversations about the operating budget? Yes, Evan. Um, which one do I want to ask? So uh, one, one is maybe just a clarification because it confused me. Mm -hmm. um, the enterprise funds, with the exception of solid waste, have a line item that they pay to the town council. Mm -hmm. what, I, don't, I, I don't understand reimbursing other departments. What are they reimbursing us for? Uh, for, in, for indirect costs. And it's a percentage of um, my salary, a percentage of the town manager's salary, a percentage of collector treasurers for billing and collecting funds. It's all in the, um, it's so, actually in the budget book. So for an enterprise fund, it's full cost accounting. So any services that we provide to them for you to serve as water and sewer commissioners, for instance, um, we're, we can charge the enterprise fund, and we should charge the enterprise fund so they reflect mm -hmm. the full cost of them doing business. It was as if we were to farm this out to some company, the idea of an enterprise fund is that you capture all of the costs and place it in that enterprise fund, and you, can, and you account for it. It's not like we hire a special finance officer, we use some of, some of Sonia's time to do that. Okay. Additional questions on this? Yes, Mark Darcy. 
Um, on the water and sewer funds, I maybe should have asked this before, but um, what are there other sources of revenue other than the water and sewer rates for those funds? Gilford mentioned new sources of revenue. Oh, so um, there are out of the uh, wastewater division, they can take uh, gray water, which is water that now goes straight to the Connecticut River and with certain processes may be able to use that for irrigation or for cooling at the university. They can use it through their HVAC systems at the university. So trying to capture that resource that's now just flowing into the Connecticut River and use, utilizing it in different ways. Um, if we, you know, there, there are opportunities that building a system that would uh, use this gray water to irrigate their fields might be another source of revenue for us from the wastewater side. So that would be funds from we, we would charge them for that, yes. Uh -huh. It would be cheaper than clean water for them, so they mm -hmm. might find it attractive. Or they may have a well that they're using, or they, they may be looking at putting in a well to, to bypass the town system altogether. Okay, thank you. Any further questions on the operating budget? Evan. I'll ask just one more. Um, the uh, maintenance costs, 30, almost $30,000 to maintain a street school. Mm -hmm. If that project, is it anticipated that we are maintaining that at least through the next fiscal year? So that property won't be released likely until fiscal year 2021? Right. Okay. Darcy? Uh, I just wanted to mention that um, in case the members of the public didn't know that, you know, the fine. I've gotten a lot of my questions answered already by watching the videos of the Finance Committee mm -hmm. over the last month, which I'm just completely amazed that you've met twice a week for the last month. Um, and also, I wanted to thank Mandy Joe for asking that huge, long list of questions because they were all, it was really informative to see your mm -hmm. questions and hear the town manager's answers to those. And I thought, I wish I had asked that question. But um, anyway, I just wanted to put that out there in case people didn't understand that we'd already seen, you know, we've already had an opportunity to ask questions and already, um, whether we were there in person or watched the videos. One of the other things that I think was extremely helpful in this year's budget process was the fact that we also went through all the orientations way back in, I guess it was February and March so that we understood what these departments did at a certain level. So then seeing their budget wasn't completely blind as well. Yes, Evan. Just to say something on that. So when I was going through the budget, I was taking notes of questions and I was categorizing them between like budget questions and then just like, oh, I'm interested in this. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel like it was necessarily appropriate to ask some of these more general questions. Um, but now that I've gone through the budget and I have a better understanding of what the goals and objectives and long-term plans are of these departments, um, I wish I had known a lot of this during those sessions. And so while I'm sure it would be uh, a lot of work for staff, if that was like an annual thing for the council early on, that would be great. Because I have 30 questions that I pulled out for departments, um, not necessarily related to the budget. And a lot of them are just like, this is a cool thing you're thinking about doing. I'd like to hear more about it um, that I wouldn't obviously ask now and I wouldn't want to email them. But um, if, that, if that was something that could become regular, I know it's, it's staff time, but that was a great service. And if I knew now what I knew then, I mm -hmm. think it would have been even more productive. Okay. So, if I can we can, on. so, so one so of the things I did have talked with the president about was to have scheduled tours of facilities. I think that's in, mm -hmm. and with department heads leading those where you can ask all the questions you want or have sessions. Again, it's, it's your time. Our, our staff will be ready, willing, ready, willing, and able to do it because we work full time. You have part time jobs here. <laughs> and, um, and I think that it's when you have availability in the managing your time uh, over the coming six months, uh, happy to do all those things. Are there further questions on yes, Kathy? It, it's not a question. I just wanted to make a comment uh, to build on Dorothy's on 
going through this with your departments, one of the things that I think we all need to be aware of, and it was very clear as we went department to department, that one of the side effects of a great labor market, meaning tight labor markets for people, is the difficulty of retaining people in town, whether it's the police department, the fire department, the library, uh, DPW, that uh, positions are, some of them are changing more rapid, people are leaving more rapidly than they might have once, um, mm -hmm. or we're not getting internships filled by top engineering students because they don't need to take an internship in Amherst during the summer. Mm -hmm. So it, and then even coming up with the minimum wage, which is a good thing to be doing, uh, it puts pressure on budgets because whoever's slightly above the minimum, it moves the pay scale. So we are in an economy that we are I think very lucky to be able to have balanced the budget this year without having to to to, to uh, deal with staff issues and be able to maintain staff. So it really was very striking as we went through the different departments how often that came up. Mm -hmm. Are there further questions? Yes, Dorothy. Just a brief comment. Um, we have been going over this a lot so that you will kind of say, what have I read? What have I done? But it's, it's really like, for me anyway, like an onion. We just peel a layer. So uh, things become more familiar. For terms, I say, I know what that means. Um, in the beginning, it's like there's just too much. So this is really to the general public. Um, don't despair. Watch the tapes. And you too will gradually understand <laughs> what's going on. Um, it's all there. I'd like to, yes, Andy. I want to, now that we're getting to the end of the discussion, just mention one other topic that was re referred to a little bit in the report, and that is that uh, when we were looking at the general services part of the budget, the, uh, the general government part of the budget that uh, funds both the town clerk's office and the town manager's office, we did have some discussion about the amount of uh, pressure that has been placed on those two departments because of the work that their staff has done to support us as a council. And uh, we didn't really reach a conclusion, but we had a very frank and honest discussion amongst ourselves with the uh, key staff about that. And uh, sort of where it was left is that recognize that this is our first year as a council and that it is a matter that uh, needs to be looked at when we get into the second year and we really see how we can f are functioning on an ongoing basis. Um, but um, it is something that uh, was a very important part of our discussion and I didn't want to um, leave today without um, thanking both uh, Paul and Margaret um, for all that they've done since they were the key um, people who were involved in that discussion, and Sonia, who's been a great yeah, help please. to us as a finance committee. Thank right. you. So, and we are going to return to the discussion of the town clerk, since mm -hmm. Margaret has offered us her letter of resignation. I haven't accepted it yet, but you know. <laughs> we're not accepting it. <laughs> Uh, so we will be talking about a process to move forward to appoint uh, a clerk of the council. Um, and there may be some opportunity to do a little shuffling with that as well. Darcy, is there anything really, or I'm going to just call time. <laughs> um, I, this is related to both the operating and capital budgets, but um, I, I'm really hoping that, I know that we're, we don't have that in this budget, but that if we, I'm hoping that we can look at future operating and capital budgets to see if we can um, find some kind of dedicated revenue stream that we could, we could um, put aside for sustainability initiatives, or at least think about it, whether it's by department or something separate. But um, I think that's something that we'll probably be talking about in the new energy committee, you know, how, how we're going to get funds for for example, consultants to do various things. Um, but just putting that out there because that's something that's coming down the pike. That's a prelude to a discussion this fall. Thank you. 
All right, I'm going to relieve you of the anxiety. You're all sitting here wondering if I'm going to read that entire item up there, and the answer is no. Uh, so here is the motion. I'd like somebody to make it. It's to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY20-04, an order appropriating the town of Amherst FY2020 operating budget as recommended by the Finance Committee and shown on pages 10 and 11 of the document entitled Town Council Finance Committee Recommendations on Fiscal Year 2020 Budget. Is there a motion? Mandy Jo moved. Second. Pat seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 And opposed? Abstain. It's 12-0 with one missing, absent. We're going to take a five minute break and come back for further budget. I'm going to ask that for items pertaining to the um, Community Preservation Act uh, materials and the capital plan that individual counselors send questions to me only, not reply all, et cetera, and you do so by the end of this week at the very latest so that we can advance those questions if and to see if we need to have anybody specially here on the 17th and then that way we will not have a discussion about those items tonight okay um, so what we're going to move on to is uh, the order an order rescinding an authorization of unissued bond and this is spoke this if you look at the finance committee report on page 14 it speaks to this particular issue, and I think at this point, Sonia, if you could give us a brief explanation of what this is about. All right, this is a housekeeping item. Back in town meeting of 2014, uh, town meeting authorized a borrowing article of borrowing authorization of a million dollars for the uh, Wildwood feasibility study. Uh, we also got reimbursements from MSBA at the same time for this. So even though we authorized the million dollars, the amount we ended up borrowing was 317000 So there's 683 that's authorized, but it was never issued. So we need to do this in order to add it back to the debt capacity. So basically, it's taking it off the books. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions about that? All right, then the motion that I need is to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY20-06, an order rescinding an authorized but unused bond as recommended by the Finance Committee and shown on page 14 of the document entitled Town Council Finance Committee Recommendation on Fiscal Year 220 Budget. Is there a motion? So moved. Mandy Jo moved, second. George Ryan, second. Any further discussion? All right, then all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, abstain? It's 12 0 in favor, one absent. Okay, um, moving on. The next one we're going to deal with is the acceptance of optional tax exemptions for FY 2020. And again, this appears in the Finance Committee report on page 21. And uh, Sonia do you, or Paul, do you want to do a brief description of what kind of exemptions we give and how that works? All right, this is really a David Burgess thing. I know. <laughs> Every year we have to authorize um, optional tax exemption. The state only allows us to authorize exemptions up to 40%, and this is bringing us up to 100%, and it's for um, qualifying exemptions for veterans, elderly, blind, surviving, surviving spouses. spouses, thank you. And handicap. And handicap. Thank you. So these are the tax exemptions we give 
in summary, the state only reimburses up to, us up to 40% for the ones that they qualify. We pay up to 100%. Any questions on this? Shalini. Just a clarifying question. Uh, like for 70 or over eld, what is that? For, um, is there an income level for which over 70 this tax exemption applies or is it just anybody? Yes, I believe there is. I don't, I don't know what the amount is or anything, but we can get those answers for you. Right. It's, it's on the website, I imagine, somewhere yes. on the website. OK. Right. If not, we have David Burgess and he'll gladly answer those questions. OK. Further questions about this? Okay, then the motion is to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY20-11, acceptance of optional tax exemptions for FY2020 as recommended by the Finance Committee and shown on page 21 of the document entitled Town Council Finance Committee Recommendations on Fiscal Year 2020 Budget. Is there a motion? I so move. Dorothy Pam moves, second. Shalini? Is there further discussion? Yes, Alyssa. Totally minor thing, but in future, for future motions like this, next time we do the next round of these, if we can make sure we show the date on the Finance Committee report, it's fine and well to call it the document and the page number, but it should always have a date as well in the motion because okay. sometimes drafts change. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? 12-0, one absent. We're on time, gang. Reminder, get me those questions about capital and also the uh, Community preservation, and don't forget that we have the capital hearing next week at 6:30 in this room. I'm uh, sorry, capital forum. Um, okay, so we've done the water and sewer. We're moving on to limitations on campaign contribution bylaw. May we have the slides and uh, Evan and Mandy Joe. So I, I guess I'll do the report um, as chair of GOL and as a sponsor, and Evan can add anything after. Um, GOL met and discussed the bylaw and the opinion, um, the written opinion of the town attorney um, that was presented to us. And in response to that opinion, um, suggests one change to this bylaw. Um, which is in the third section. Um, and when I get to that, because I think, do we technically have to actually read the whole thing because of the charter says it needs read at two meetings? Um, Margaret, that was a question. Do yeah. we have to actually do read? Do I have to read the actual bylaw proposal because of the charter language that says bylaws must be read at two meetings? If you take that literally. Okay. So I'll, I'll read what's on the screen. It's not that long. Can, can I, uh, excuse me. So, yes. So I think a lot of councils don't literally read. Okay. They, they consider reading is that it's available to be read, not that you have to read every word. That's how I've seen other councils work. <laughs> I'll, I'll go with that then, because I'd rather not read the whole thing. We um, also want to just note that this was in the packet. It was made available to the public and is shown on the screen as well as for all of the ind individual counselors. Yes, and this is actually the second time we're seeing it, minus that one change. Um, so uh, to fi finish the GOL report, the GOL voted 3-0 with two abstentions, which were myself and Evan. Um, to declare the proposed bylaw as amended at the GL, GOL meeting clear, consistent, and actionable. Um, section A that is on the screen right now remains the same as it did two weeks ago at our last meeting, which would, number one, A1 would limit contributions from individuals to a candidate or candidate campaign to $250 at, at this time, $250 a year. 
A2 would limit contributions from municipal PACs to candidates or candidate cam um, candidate campaign committees um, to $125 um, a year. Uh, section B would um, limit individual contributions to municipal PACs to $125 a year. Um, and section C is the one section, and that section had no changes either at GOL, and section C is the one change, one section that did have a change, and it involves the last sentence. Um, this is the enforcement section, and the last sentence was changed to subject to be a fine not exceeding 250. That was deemed by the town attorney not quite actionable, so that, that fines have to be a certain amount, not an up to amount, so that GOL changed it to uh, excess contributions, purge excess contributions, the fine would be subject to a fine of $250 to make it an amount certain. That's the only change GOL recommended. The sponsors accepted that change and uh, were okay with it. So in keeping with GOL's policies and procedures, they talked to the sponsors beforehand. Um, and this was the declared um, vote that the campaign finance bylaw is clear, consistent, and actionable we did not talk about the policy of actually adopting this and the pros and cons in that meeting. We'll start with uh, comments from the council and then we will have public comment. I also want to apologize. I forgot the public comment on the budget and we'll come back to that. So council comments. Yes, Dorothy. Um, well, I am opposed to this um, bylaw. I think the limit is too low. And there are a number of reasons. Uh, one, it mentions money, but it does not mo mention in-kind contributions, which can be worth more than money. Uh, secondly, somebody who is <clears throat> new to the town politics uh, or may have lived here a long time but not been active in town may have to do more to become known in order to run a campaign. And there are no limitations on individual money. So if that person has a lot of their own money, then they can spend it. But if that person does not have a lot of their own money, they can't. They have to raise whatever money they need from other sources. And if the limit for the contribution, total contribution is 125 a person per campaign, that means they'll spend a lot of time running around raising money instead of getting to know people and going door to door and talking to people. Because you really don't raise money going door to door and getting to know people. That's not how you raise money. So I feel that instead of opening up, I understand the purpose of this bylaw is to make it more attractive and seem easier for more people to enter. I understand that that's the goal, but I'm saying I don't think it would work. Uh, I believe, Steve, you had your hand up earlier. So I am also opposed, and maybe for slightly different reasons than stated by Councillor Pam, but one is that there, I find that there's a logic problem in the statement, which makes a comparison of Boston to Amherst. So and the say in Boston is 10 times as many voters. So the, the, the statement says that then the individual contribution should be less in Amherst because we're a smaller community. But this isn't about the aggregate contribution. So this isn't about all contributions that you have at your, at your disposal. It's about single individuals contributing to your campaign. So the logic would then be in Boston if there's 10 times as many voters, there'd also be 10 times as many contributors. So basically, the state law doesn't make a distinction between sizes of communities for that exact reason, that the assumption is that there's the same proportion of donors in the same effort to reach out, proportionally <laughs> the same effort to reach out to, to, um, to voters. So that's one reason. The second one is that the state law doesn't really have a provision for exceptions. So we know that Northampton did this. That's an anomaly. And there's some question as to whether or not that can be challenged. But my feeling is that if we feel that this should be tailored for particular communities based on size, based on whatever the qualities are, then we should be trying to change state law, that we shouldn't be acting on our own to sort of make up numbers, that we don't even know if those are the right numbers. Um, the third thing is the limit itself. So 250 to me seems really low. So if you look at recent school committee elections, a number of the candidates, or some of the candidates 
that really fit the profile of whom we're trying to help or whom this, this bylaw is trying to help exceeded the 250 limit. They had $500 contributions. So these were newcomers to the Amherst political scene. So, you know, I have, I have no comment as to, you know, the sources of those, but they were above the 250. And so the, these are, um, so if the effort is to diversify the pool, there's evidence that, in fact, this would restrict the pool. And so um, there's also, similar to what Councillor Pam was saying, that there's comments in here about broad-based support, that people who are incumbents already have a broad-based support, but then the intent of this is to encourage broad-based support. Those are contradictory ideas, in my opinion, and I have no judgment as to whether or not a, someone who is running with no campaign contributions or with a single friend that's able to contribute $1,000 to help them along. I have no opinion as to whether or not which of those candidates may or may not be the better one. So I think that the state law does fine in this particular circumstance. I don't think we should be meddling with the state law or I think we should, if we really feel that it's worth changing, we should act to change the state law but not have our own new kind of um, new limits. Additional comments, Andy? Oh, I'm sorry, Evan had his hand up. So I just, uh, I'll be brief, I just wanted to correct one thing that, that Councillor Pam said, um, the statement that this does not cover in-kind contributions, this does cover in-kind contributions. Um, a contribute, and this, we, this was run by uh, OCPF, and a contribution is defined as either monetary or in-kind. So um, anything that OCPF de defines as in-kind contribution is encompassed by this. Uh, to speak to the um, question of the limit, um, you know, I think that that's a real debate that Mandy Jo and I expected to have in the council is, um, and we heard this last time, is 250 too low. Um, the, the, I guess my question that I would ask is, is $1,000 too high, right? And so the question is, right now you can, country, uh, you can receive from an individual person $1,000. To me personally, that feels high for Amherst. So if you feel like $250 is too low, the next question is, is a $1,000 contribution too high? And if your answer is yes, $1,000 is too high, then, then what is it? So I think the, the real question here is, do you think $1,000 is too high? And if you don't, then you know how to vote on this, right? But if you do think $1,000 is too high, what do you think is the acceptable level? And if it's not 250 what is it? And I think that's the conversation uh, that I expected to have and that I would also be interested in hearing from people about. Okay. Uh, Darcy. Um, did you, in your, um, and I'm addressing this to Evan or Mandy Jo, um, when you were finding out about in-kind contributions, what, what is the value of a, an email list of X number of people um, that has already been honed to be all of the potential supporters? So my understanding is an email list that you purchase from an organization, it's the value is the purchase value, um, but an email list you receive from someone um, is not encompassed by OCPF. Um, and my understanding is that uh, there are some comments about whether or not uh, this could encompass that. Um, that would dramatically expand this because it would go beyond just tightening what exists and it would actually be broadening. Um, I think there's some question about whether legally we could uh, do that. Uh, my, my impression is that we, we probably would be uh, running afoul of, of state law if we were to start to redefine these categories for OCPF. So are, are there some in-kind contributions that you do have the value of? For example, um, uh, uh, assistance in setting up a website uh, that is offered free of charge? Mandy Jo. So as Evan said, all of that's in some sense 
governed by OCPF, the Office of Campaign and Political Finance, and how they define what an in-kind contribution is, and we are not attempting to redefine that. But for example, um, a number of us that are sitting here and some that were not elected were supported by a group called Amherst Forward, a municipal PAC. We all on our year-end contribution reports had to claim my number was $120 and like 28 cents or something like that as an in-kind contribution for a mailing that they did. Um, that is quite just under that 125 this is proposing. Um, but that is an example of an in-kind contribution, a mailing that I know as a candidate myself I never saw. I don't know who it was distributed to, but I had to list that as an in-kind contribution on my campaign finance report. And it would not, if it exceeded $125 in a future election, I would have to purge the excess, even though I never received any money from that municipal pack. I would have to purge if they had told me that that in-kind contribution was worth $150, I would need to find $25 somewhere in my campaign and purge it either back to the PAC or to a, um, what is it, it's a charity, essentially. Um, and so that's an example of an in-kind contribution that is covered under this bylaw at, per the Office of Campaign and Political Finance. Dorothy. Um, I think $125 mailing, I just really don't even know how you would do that. Um, I did a mailing and it certainly cost a lot more than that, which I paid for myself. I mean, the printing, the postage, um, there's not that many of them. But I think what you're starting to talk about is getting awfully complex. I think if you want to encourage people to run, to keep it open, uh, I do agree $1,000 may be too high. I agree with you. Uh, because I never got a $1,000 contribution. I think it kind of depends upon where you feel about that. But um, I think you could say 500 or I think there used to be something 400 or $450. At least I heard that informally before. Um, I think we don't want to make it so you have to have a treasurer who's spending all of their time figuring out balancing and, and doing that kind of thing and to, to keep it open because otherwise you're going to have people who have their own independent money finding this is no problem for me, I can just spend my money, okay? Um, and people who don't, um, they're going to spend all their time raising funds. Darcy, you had a question or a comment? Uh, yeah, I just, uh, you know, on the issue of in-kind contributions, I feel like uh, the, the, I had to, you know, when I was campaigning, I had to pay for um, website development, uh, you know, a lot of money. Um, and I think that that was offered to candidates supported by Emerson Forward. At least I think it was offered to me when they were courting all the different candidates. Um, I believe that Emerson Forward either sent out mailings on behalf of candidates or offered them mailing lists. I'm not sure because I wasn't supported by Emerson Forward, but but I feel like. Um, that in an in a in an ideal world, this would be a great um, campaign finance bylaw. But in Amherst, in particular, where we have one PAC, it doesn't really make sense to me because the PAC provides a huge amount of service to candidates that are supported by that PAC, and the other candidates don't get anything. So, um, you know, I received a fairly large amount of, of funding from people who were interested in, in uh, sustainability issues. And, um, but I had a mail mailing list of like 125 people, whereas I know other people have larger mailing lists that, because they had help from Amherst Forward. So um, I... I guess I feel like this is, Amherst is, has other issues <laughs> that it has to deal with that um, are separate from this and this doesn't level the playing field. Uh, Andy. 
This has several things. One is, is that one of the re major reasons it was put forward for this proposal was that it would encourage or enable more candidates to step forward and participate as, or potential candidates as candidates. Uh, certainly, uh, the Gazette in its editorial made findings that were totally contradictory to that just because it pointed out that Northampton, which had that intention presumably behind its um, campaign finance rule, did not in fact get that result that was just described. Um, the second thing that I thought about as I've been dealing with is that um, when I heard arguments being made um, potentially in a town meeting that didn't end up happening as to why there should be campaign financing. It was actually for a different reason and one that I actually did give more thought to and that was um, whether big donors would then feel some ability to influence the person if elected than um, smaller donors were and uh, I don't know that that's true or not, but it is really a very different reason. But the third thing is, is that this actually could be a barrier to some new candidate coming forward because um, a candidate, somebody who has not run, has never been involved in the political process, but someone else has a lot of faith in that individual and says, if you run, I'll help you out and it enables that person to get into the race and to um, start a campaign going that they would not have been able to do but for that one big donation. Uh, that's actually turned out to flip the whole thing on its uh, head because that person would not have the ability to get that one big donation that would help them kickstart their campaign. So I'm not sure that I see the connection between the intentions that are being put forward and the, uh, what's being proposed as being logical connections. Uh, um, Steve, or I'm gonna go to Alyssa only because you've spoken already. Thank you. So in addition to all the things that were said tonight, and I really appreciate Andy following up on something I said last time this came up about it serving as a barrier for some cases, I just wanna add a couple of points associated with the frustration I'm hearing expressed about a particular PAC that existed at a particular moment in time and say a couple of things about that. One is there have always been organizations in this town that have promoted candidates that have not necessarily followed Office of Campaign and Political Finance rules. That is true. I've been in town government for 11 years and I know of flyers that were made, mailings that were made, that were never claimed in any fashion. So putting this all at the feet of one particular pack, I find is, is not helpful. Um, I would love to see an organization that will help new candidates and uh, maybe the league isn't really quite prepared to do that at this point in, because they can't talk about individual candidates. They do things for all of us. But I think it would be great to have such an organization that would really help. Let's be clear that various website purchases and mailing purchases as, as Evan spoke to, you know, you can purchase a mailing list, but you can also get free mailing lists and that's perfectly okay under Office of Campaign and Political Finance rules. You can also get free website development in many cases under certain considerations. And so while it's true that some candidates had to pay for their website, some did not and it had nothing to do with Amherst Forward. It had to do with who was providing the services and how Office of Campaign and Political Finance looked at that. Whether it's unfortunate that some people spend $500 on their website and other people got them for free, it's not about Amherst Forward. It's about whether or not they thought they were complying with Office of Campaign and Political Finance rules, which does in fact allow for that to happen. And let's also bear in mind that when we talk about money, one of the other things money purchases is lawn signs. Now, some people don't like lawn signs, but if you're going to have lawn signs, there are a couple of different things you're fighting with in terms of what are your values as to how much you pay for lawn signs. Traditionally, until we had local printing ability for that, lawn signs were made in Kansas or they were made here. They can have union bugs or not have union bugs. Shipping costs, environmental costs associated with shipping, 
versus the cheapest possible web lawn sign you can get now that's from out of the country. So all those things play into, you know, what is my candidate? Is, is I, am I concerned that my candidate got $1,000? Am I concerned that my candidate bought cheap lawn signs or bought local lawn signs that kept the money in the economy? <laughs> all those things play into this. And so when we put a really low dollar limit on things, we artificially constrict that situation as well. I don't want to have to buy my lawn signs from out of the state, much less locally, so that I can afford to do some of the other things that people are talking about doing. I want to keep the money locally. So those are all choices we have to make. So that, in addition to all the other things people said, are why I can't support this. Are there other comments? I'm actually going to, this is the first of two readings on this. We're not taking a vote tonight. I also do want to allow for public comment. Steve. So, so whether this should be 250 or 500 or 1,000 dollars or 750 or 499 or whatever, to me is a political decision. So once you get above certain thresholds, 200 dollars, name and occupation, it becomes more and more public. The donations become more and more public. So whether you want, if you want to accept a 1,000 dollar donation for your political campaign, you do so at your own peril, basically, because that becomes public information. It can be used in any political race in ways that are political. So that's a decision that each candidate should be able to make on his or her own. There are some very good and noble $1,000 donors you know, out there, and there are some very good reasons for accepting $1,000 donations. The other thing is pay attention to the fine. So, so here we are trying to encourage people to we're trying to um, encourage people to get into politics, right? So we have a very, if we have a very low threshold for donations, the people that are most likely to get in trouble are the ones that don't have political experience. The, so they perhaps sort of read the state law, which says that there's this $1,000 cap. So they might be accepting donations above this limit and be subject to this fine. It's highly, there aren't that many $1,000 donations in Amherst, as has been noted in the, the white paper. So the prospect of someone getting in trouble is much less likely if we simply keep the state cap. Further comments, Shalini. I just um, I wanted to ask Evan and Mandy Jo if they had uh, done some kind of research on what were best practices in terms of doing something like this, like would. would what is the amount, like two, with 250 or 500, like what kind of, re like what is your reasoning for suggesting these figures? Evan. So we spoke to this a little bit last time, which was basically, um, so Northampton's is at 500, and the rationale for that was um, that that occurred after the state had upped its limit, um, and they essentially bumped back down to what the state limit was. Um, because Northampton has mayoral elections, which are more expensive um, in some ways, um, we felt like the limit could be lower. Uh, I think I speak for myself, but I, I think that Mandy Jo agrees with me. It says that we are amenable to a conversation of, of increasing the limit if people feel like 250 is too low, which is why I said last time, the real, I think the real question is, do you think $1,000 is too high? Um, and so... Um, if folks here say a thousand, two fifties, that's peanuts and that's too little, but a thousand dollars is outrageous. You know, I think that we're, we're open to amendments of that number. Um, one thing, just since I have the mic with it, I also want to say is, you know, I, I've, I've heard a lot of, um, this won't fix the problem you identified. And I think my response to that is, of course it won't, right? Because no one solution, no one bylaw will fix a problem that has a whole lot of causes. Um, the Gazette article that Andy referenced um, looked at this skeptically and then proposed pairing it with something else, which is to say, maybe if this is paired with something else, it'll work. And my first thought was, yes, of course, this has to be paired with many things. Um, my hope is that over the next several years might be ambitious, maybe decades, but that, that the town will continue to improve its elections to be better. That will require a series of bylaws. Um, to me, this was a first step. It was a low-hanging fruit that we could do. And my hope would be, should this pass, 
that then we can say, okay, now what do we pair with this to make things better? And I would be happy, uh, other counselors uh, offered things in our last discussion about ideas that they had. I would be more than happy to work with any counselor on any idea on how to make our elections better because my thought is this, has to, this would be one piece of a much larger puzzle. So regardless of how this, this goes, I don't want anyone to say, well, Evan said this would fix things. No, of course it wouldn't, right? This is one thing. And so the, the, the question, I guess, is do we feel as a council that we want a lower than a $1,000 limit? And I think that's the, the central question before us. Are there any other comments before I move to public? Yes, George. I'm glad we're not voting on this this evening, and this is part of a process, but I, I really am struggling with the idea that there is a problem in Amherst that needs to be solved by this this measure. Um, we just had our first election in this regard. Um, I will take a closer look at the numbers from the recent election. But at the moment, I don't get a sense that that uh, this is something that needs to be addressed at this moment. Um, maybe over time, we may discover that we really have a problem here in Amherst with finance contributions and, and things are out of control. But uh, I don't get that sense myself personally but I'm going to think about it over the next two weeks. Kathy. Um, just, I, I, I think I'm building on George's comment a little. To the extent I think there's a problem, I don't think this is the problem. Um, I think uh, that, that too much money was flowing in to some people versus others. I think if you're a first time candidate and running, that unless you find a lot of willing volunteers, which I was very able to do, um, who could do some technical support, um, it's hard to jump in. So I think something that would make entry easier is if we could, uh, over the next year or two, figure out a very cheap way to do a re website and make that available to everyone. Just, you know, here's the cheapest possible way to do a website. Here's the cheapest, no cost, do it yourself kit, you know, like write an essay and plunk it up with a, a trainer. Uh, some briefing books could be prepared. The town has just done a wonderful job for us when we first came in as counselors. But you could have, you know, here's the basics about the town that just everyone who wanted to run could get access to rather than some people got to. So I think there's some things we could do that if you wanted to jump in and hadn't been heavily involved before would make it easier. Um, so. I'm not sure this addresses the problem in seeing, I, I'd have to go look at the campaign contributions. A lot, not the people who ran successfully didn't necessarily have the biggest pots of money at all. And some of the people who had bigger pots of money didn't win. But so I think money is a problem, but I don't think this is going to fix it. And I'm very troubled, uh, Steve's pointing out the 250 penalty you know, if, if we're going to put any cap, I don't want to penalize people. Just have them pay it back you know, if, if they exceeded the cap by accident or whatever, or let it sit in a pool. You know, monitoring this and slapping on hands. But I, I understand why it's there. It's to enforce it. But, but I, I just not sure this gets at the making it easier to enter problem that we're trying to work on. Linda Joe. So I want to address both the last two comments um, and Steve's comment about the fine. So the fine is the last. There is a 15 day to purge without receiving a fine. This is not, oh, you did, you missed it, now you pay 250. This is, oh, you missed it, purge it. Purge means pay it back to the person that gave it or donate it to a charity. You do that within 15 days, there is no fine. So let's, you know, it's not jump to a fine immediately, it's rectify the mistake, and if you don't rectify it, then there's a fine. And I am certainly open to, as a sponsor, changing that number if people think that is too high. Just like if people think the 250 and 125 is too low, I'm amenable to a different number. To address the, it's not a problem now, um, let's maybe deal with it when it might become a problem. I would just offer, if by the point a council sees it as a problem, it's probably too late. 
because you've already had at least one election, if not more, that it's been a problem. The best time to deal with something of a concern, and I know during this campaign and also the charter campaign itself, this was a huge concern of people in town that campaigns would cost too much to run. It would cost too much. It would be influenced by big money. It would be influenced by large donations. We might not have seen it this first one, but by the time you see it, it's probably too late to fix, or it might be too late to fix. I'll give you an example of something we're seeing now. Town meeting attempted to adopt form-based zoning prior to large buildings going in and downtown. It did not adopt form-based zoning before that. Now we have large buildings in downtown at five stories. If form-based zoning is future adopted, some of that form is based on the buildings that are there now. It is potentially too late to rectify what that form of downtown looks like because it was not done prior to the building of the first couple of those buildings. That's not to say we shouldn't enact form-based zoning. I'm still really want to see it happen. But sometimes if you wait till it's a problem, it's too late. And I think this is one of those times. I'm going to suggest that because we will be taking this up at a future meeting that we move to public comment. Uh, and I also want to suggest that we will do everything we can to fit this on the agenda for the 17th, but we know that that will also be a full agenda. So is there any public comment on this particular issue? Please come forward, make sure the light's on, state your name and where you live. Hi, uh, <clears throat> Jennifer Page, 291 Potwine Lane. So I think the cap is too low at one quarter of the state maximum. I, I might be in favor of a cap of half the state maximum, um, but right now 250 feels too low. And full disclosure, I say this as a former school committee candidate whose parents got me started with a $500 donation to my campaign. Uh, the idea that this bylaw would encourage an increase in the number of people running for office seems misguided to me. I don't see it as a barrier to entry to running for office that currently individuals can donate up to $1,000. Perhaps the thinking is that if, if I'm someone who's new and considering running for office, I might be intimidated by the idea that another candidate would be able to raise more money than I could. But if that's the case, then it makes more sense to cap the total amount as opposed to individual contributions. And if the goal is to encourage people from all socioeconomic groups to run, then I think that, that you need to talk to people from those groups. Talk to Ben Harrington, talk to Vera Cage, talk to people who are renters who ran for townwide office and see what they think, if you haven't yet, and see what they think about this bylaw. Um, so, um, so in my opinion, there are far better ways and more effective ways to encourage more people to run for office, to encourage people from many different groups to run for office. One would be for the town council to endorse the legislation that's currently making its way through our state legislature called an act supporting parents running for public office, which would allow candidates to spend campaign funds on child care. Another would be to not have town council meetings and school committee meetings that run till all hours of the night. Those two things would show that you are supportive of, of a broader group of people running for office, more so than capping individual contributions to $250. And lastly, capping even in-kind donations could actually discourage the very people that you want to encourage to run. If I'm someone who's new to public service and I don't know a lot of people, but I have a friend who's a graphic designer or a web developer um, who's willing to donate their time to running my campaign website, I'd only be able to take $250 worth of their service their time and effort, and that would be a hindrance to people who are all not already well connected. So I would encourage you to think about a higher cap or, or no cap at all. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there other comments at this time on this issue? Sure. Um, Julian Hines, 54 High Street, Amherst. Um, so I feel like pretty much every number I've seen on the screen like the fine of 250 and the caps on political action committees and campaign finance. All of this is a good first step, even though we've got so much more to do. I encourage you to take this first step and to start limiting 
people from giving so much from political action committees and people from giving so much to certain candidates. For example, we know one person gave over a thousand dollars in in this type of thing. That thousand dollars for one person is some random donation that doesn't really affect them much. Where a thousand dollars to another person could be their rent or mortgage. So I think it's important to understand that this is a good first step, but only a first step. We need to build from here so we can get a more diverse, less wealthy group of applicants to come to town council. And at this late time of the night, it's particularly difficult for people who have jobs that run at certain hours and who have kids to come participate and get their voice heard in town government. So I think what we should do is we should use this money cap as a good first step to sort of jump on or trampoline off of to a different step that would help us even more to get a more diverse, less wealthy pool of applicants in to our town council. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any other comments at this time? Is there any final comment from the council remembering that we will be returning to this at a future meeting? Okay, hearing none, then we're going to, uh, I just wanna clarify, when this comes up for a vote, it's a majority vote, is that correct? Bylaws that are other than zoning bylaws. General bylaws, General bylaws General are bylaws a majority. majority. Thank you. Seven, minimum of seven. Yes, it's a majority of the full council, whether they're present or not. Um, okay, we uh, have one more item on, oh, I wanna go back. Is there anybody here that has a comment on the budget? All right, thank you. Um, I wanna go back, I wanna move on then to the town manager evaluation process and calendar. So uh, let me just explain that in my attempt to help OCA move forward with this part of their charge, which was to propose a process and timeline for the town manager evaluation. Um, I met in advance with Alyssa Brewer and also with Andy. Um, I've still not had a chance to meet with Doug Stein uh, Slaughter, uh, or frankly, one of the, any of the other uh, previous town councilors. Um, town, I'm sorry, um, select. select board members. Um, so this is a calendar that's proposed based on the format of the evaluation that has taken place in the past. And it has a very tight time frame of basically everything occurring from the beginning of June through the end of August. And it has um, the creation, although we have discussed a potential alternative of a, um, a web, I mean, I'm sorry, an email address that all comments can be sent to. Comments are th sought from counselors through a form, uh, through committee people, uh, through an open format where an email is sent to committee chairs and they share it with their committee members, uh, from staff where they are sent something and also a form to fill out, and also then posted on the town website so that anybody from town is willing is uh, welcome to sending comments. Those comments from town councilors and the evaluation forms are public. All the other items are not public, but they are made available to all councilors. And they are made available to all councilors in such a manner that they can then incorporate, if you will, by example or trend or whatever, what they might see all of that is then put into a composite document by the president of the council, previously the chair of the select board. 
and discussed with the town manager, but then brought immediately to the council. And at that point, along with the composite, counselors see everybody else's, um, every other counselor's feedback on their form. And they sit here for a night and they read with a camera flowing. Um, I'm not sure I like that, but nevertheless, that's the practice in the past. And uh, at the end of that, they hold a discussion. So predominantly that meeting is strictly um, on the issue of the town manager's evaluation. And would pro be proposed that that meeting would be on August 19th. From that, the next meeting, uh, those comments are taken into consideration. And at the next meeting of the council, which in this case would be one week later, uh, a final evaluation form is presented or final evaluation composite and comments are presented and in, in an executive set, that's done in public session, but in an executive session, a discussion is, takes place regarding compensation of the town manager, and we resume then in public session. So basically, that outlines the calendar. There were many other accompanying documents with what you received. Um, and one of those documents was taking the manager's goals of this year which were established with the select board and putting them into the format that has been used in the past. And it makes up about a 13 page document. Um, the thing that I think many of us as counselors will struggle with is whether or not we feel that we honestly have enough information to evaluate the town manager using those goals. Uh, that were agreed to between the council, between the select board and the count, and the manager. You will also receive a self-assessment by the manager done against those goals, and you have your own experience as well. So, um, we I met today with Oka, and frankly, it was a very excellent conversation with lots of good. Uh, questions, feedback, concerns. We made a few adjustments to this timeline, which you'll see up above, um, including the possibility that on the night we sit here and read, we would meet as early as five. But I also mentioned as we went through this that I feel that this is an area in which we need to take a serious look and come up with a way to revise the process in the coming years. Um, in preparation for this, uh, Mr. Vakaman uh, did poll other towns. Uh, bluntly, they pale in comparison to what we do because they don't look for staff comment. In many instances, they don't look for public comment or committee comment. And sometimes they even forget to do the evaluation. Um, so it, this is not... Uh, something that Amherst has done in any way that is shabby, but it is something that we as a council need to look at. Uh, but nevertheless, every year at this time of the year, the town manager does need to be evaluated and we need to proceed with something. So with that, I guess I would like um, the members of OCA, Alyssa, to comment on this further. Great. We did have a very long discussion. We really appreciated that Lynn could come to our meeting this morning so we could discuss this. And you, as you all will remember, of course, from the charge that you voted on in December, that OCA is to coordinate this process. And so I, obviously, as you know, and as we'll be talking about tonight, there are lots of committee appointments that we've been needing to focus on to get done in a certain period of time. And while it may not seem self-evident to all of you, but it does seem self-evident to me, having done this for many years, that this would not be the year to change the process, but that we would never do it again after this way. Because this way is the way it's been being done. There's this weird transition where there was the select board and the town council, but it is not going to be a viable method moving forward. We'll have to have lots of discussion about how that's gonna work. And so that's worth keeping in mind as you look at all these pieces of paper and think, wow, I actually really appreciate all the work the select board over the years did doing this. Thank you. So um, 
that all being said, and you can read oodles of old evaluations on the town website anytime you want, a couple, the two things that we came up with as votes, in addition to many, just many questions about how the process works and how we might improve it already, thinking through how might things work in the future, is that OCA voted to adopt the town manager evaluation timeline as amended, as it was amended this morning by Lynn on the fly as we were talking, where we tried, we basically just consolidated a couple of dates to make a few things less confusing. We also voted unanimously that while former select board members are welcome to participate as committee members, which some of them are right now, or members of the public, they're not they are not participating as select board members. They're not filling out the town council evaluation form. The only people that fill out the town council evaluation form are town councilors. The only people who fill out the staff form are staff, and then there aren't forms for anybody else. As you can see from the many pieces of paper you received and that you had in your packet electronically over the weekend, we put information out on the town website that says, please go look at the goals that were established, then you'll know what we're rating the person on. But if you want to complain about a bridge, that's fine too. Actually, it doesn't say that on the website, but we know that people will do that, and that's fine, but sometimes they want guidance. As to what we are looking at. And of course, what's also really important, as Lynn pointed out, is that although it doesn't happen this early in the process, soon in the process, you'll be getting the town manager's self-evaluation. So anything that you're like, I don't even know what that means, when you look at the particular statement, you will understand once he explains what he's been working on associated with that. And then all those things that you end up marking, I don't know what that means. Maybe those aren't good goals for us to carry forward. Maybe those would be different goals for us moving forward. So we had those conversations. We had the two votes about adopting the timeline and how former select board members fit into this because we looked at it as just as if we set the goals and at some future year, not all of us may choose to run for re-election, not all of us may gain re-election, and so whoever's there at the time that it is time to do evaluation is who fills them out. The idea did also come up briefly, and I believe Lynn touched on it. This is the time of year we've been doing this because it's just the time of year we've always done it, and it's also when the town manager's contract changes, but there certainly can be future discussion about is another time of year better? So based on all the other kinds of things we do as we develop our new, brand new, spanking new town council schedule. So this is just the process for this year, one time only. Is there anybody else from OCA that would like to add to that? Okay, questions? Yes. So when you spoke about it, you said we will sit here and each read our own evaluation. Yeah, everybody else's, I'm sorry. Okay, so is this reading, to, do we just sit here and pass them around the table quietly you, or do when, we read them out loud? No, when you walk in the room, you're given a packet and you literally sit here quietly and read them. Okay, that sounds much better because the other sounded like a roast. And um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> the, the idea of Paul having to sit here with a camera on his face while we... It, it was, it's going to take a while to top that one, Dorothy. <laughs> yes. So I definitely can't top that. Um, I, I have a couple of questions and concerns about this timeline. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed, and, and I'm just going to go through a couple of them. Uh, I'll go through them in the order I have them written. Um, the date for committee chairs, well, committee evaluations due was the 5th, is now the 12th. That goes along with the public comments. Right. Um, but on the 15th, the 12th is a Friday by 4 p.m., and on the 15th Monday is when this document says that the illustrious Angela Mills needs to <laughs> send everything out to the counselors. That seems like a very quick turnaround that may not be practical or advisable. So I'm concerned about that, especially with the change to everything being due the Friday before the Monday it all goes out. Um, I'm concerned about the council receiving all of the counselors evaluations the same day it receives the composite evaluation because it does not give, in my mind, the counselors 
time to really digest the 13 evaluations to ensure that the composite evaluation is accurate, complete, and isn't missing anything. If you're trying to do that all at the same meeting at the same time, that seems really difficult. Um, I'm concerned with the cancellation of the August 5th meeting. Um, our president just stated that we have a really full agenda in two weeks that we might not be able to add something to it, like the bylaw thing, as in sort of a normal course. If we're already really full and we're still going to be full with these other things, should we be canceling a meeting in August where we could actually do non-evaluation items? Um, I'm not necessarily saying it needs to be an evaluation meeting, but if it looks like the 19th would be full of reading reviews and discussing everything, that might not have normal business on it. The 26th might not have normal business on it. The 22nd of July may or may not have a lot of normal business. Are we hampering ourselves come September to actually get typical business done by canceling an August 5th meeting? Um, and then... Oh, and then one thing about the staff emails, like the, the thing, and this isn't a timeline issue, um, there was in the staff letter, it said that staff responses remain anonymous unless they choose not to be. Not confidential because the town manager reads them and we read them, but if the email, if they choose to respond by email and that email response goes to the email here that includes the manager and the council, they're not anonymous even if they choose to unless they print them on paper. Is there a way we could give the staff an email address because that just saves on paper that doesn't, I, I don't know, is there a way to keep an email from staff anonymous without having them to require submitting theirs on paper if they want to remain anonymous? Okay. Uh, that was a lot. <laughs> Okay. Did you have another, a question? I can wait too, but I just wanted to say about the anonymous thing. I I think we should just keep it all anonymous because of the people who don't. I mean, it deters people who are. Um, the, the, I mean, if people can have the choice to give their name and not, then the people who are not giving their name would feel awkward and right. they might be identifiable. Okay. So on the issue of anonymous, you can also provide a hard copy and that can be put into the town mail. So you can peep, keep it totally anonymous. No, it's just with right. email, you can. It's, I don't done. know of how to do that, yes. Um, okay, Alyssa. So we've been doing this for a while. Unfortunately, the staff we have now has not. And so that's been one of the difficulties is they don't necessarily realize what's available to them IT-wise. So for example, as you may, or in fact, I know some of you were not aware, the town council address that we currently use doesn't just include town councilors. It includes the town manager. It includes the assistant town manager. It includes Angela. It includes Margaret. What we did in the past is we had IT strip those people out for the short period of time when people were sending us the public comment. The advantage to that is people were already used to our address, select board at. They didn't have to come up with a new address. The disadvantage to doing that is we had to change something, right? Whereas if you just set up a new address, then you don't have to change anything. However, you will have people who will use the town council address because they didn't pay any attention to the evaluation address. And so therefore, it will not be confidential, except all those employees are no, always have to deal with confidential things. Just like if somebody walks a letter in, as Lynn mentioned, there's a box for people who actually want to do it the old fashioned way. If somebody from the public wants to walk in a letter, they don't read those. They scan them, but they don't read them. There was a way, we, in years past, many, for many years, we did not allow any electronic submissions from staff for the exact reason you're referring to. We, they were all on paper. In fact, they were on special paper, so it was clear that no one was ballot stuffing. It was very fancy. Um, H, the HR director we had then, who may or may not have left notes about this for the, for the next person, figured out a way to provide that electronically that she didn't see who sent them in and who didn't. And then 
in terms of turning the information back out, your concern always viable associated with staff time, there isn't anything to turn back out in many cases because most submissions have been made to us electronically. But the staff ones, if we get a good turnout, yay, um, you can look at old ones to see how good a turnout we get. Those do need to be submitted to us either by someone scanning them or by someone photocopying them. And so that is actually you know, a few minutes work at the copier. But if, since most people will send us electronic comments, whether they're committee chairs or members of the public, we get those, we all will get those directly no matter what email address we end up using. And so you'll have those weeks before you actually sit down to write your evaluation. And the time for the evaluation is building into the fact that many of us go away on vacation at some point in the summer. And that's also true for committees. And that's also true for staff. And so that's why some of those guide timelines are in there that might seem longer than necessary is because we know some people will be away when the first notices go out. I hope that answered most of the things. The other piece that um, was pointed out at the OCA meeting today, and that is that if you, Liz is going to be able to say this better, if we sent all of our evaluations individually to people in advance via email, it's a violation of open meeting law. I, I'm aware of that. I'm wondering, I guess one of my questions was, could it be done at two separate meetings? Um, you but, get the full evaluations at one and the composite a week later at a different one, which it's not at this point, I don't think. From Well, the, you've got the 19th and, for when you get it all, and then you meet again on the 26th. So there's two meetings. Well, I guess the 19th when you get it all, it's hard to com talk about a composite if you've just read everything. and. Isn't I, OCA's been doing this where the OCA designees report gets posted on the website simultaneously with the, the on the calendar listing simultaneously with the notice of the meeting and that's certainly an opinion. Is that something that since these are going to be public documents anyway is my understanding that the counselor evaluations could be posted simultaneously with the meeting notice on the calendar so that the counselors have it two days before they see the composite. We Listen. talked about this at OCA, and I'm yeah. sorry, I did write that down, but it was one of the questions I didn't answer, because evidently I didn't make the font big enough on my notes. Um, so there is a reason for that, Mandy Jo. The reason for that is a political reason. If you release that information by posting it to an agenda, which is technically OK to do, so that you do have it ahead of time, you've now lost control of the narrative. So now you have the press writing articles about what Mandy Jo wrote on her evaluation, what's on the draft composite, and what Alyssa wrote on her evaluation. When you do it all at the same time, which has been our tradition of doing it with that really boring reading meeting, yes, it's going to be more work than it was when we were reading five. But remember, the composite is not copying. The cop composite's actually just a bunch of check marks. The cover sheet to that if you look at one of the old ones, and obviously Lynn can do it however she wants, but it's not 40 pages long. It's actually shorter than the individual evaluations because she's talking about themes. She's not copying down what everybody else wrote. So I don't deny that it's a huge amount to digest, but if you post it ahead of time and do it in such a way that you're not doing it simultaneously with the press and the public seeing it here, you now have everything out in the ether. Whereas if they want to sit here and post to their blog while we're sitting here reading, I suppose that's OK. But at least we know we're going to have our first conversation that night and then our second conversation, as Lynn pointed out, on those two different things. But that is the reason for it. It seems super efficient to get it ahead of time. It also means that just all this stuff is out in the world. And then someone's asking you in the grocery store what you thought of Shalini's evaluation before you've had a chance to sit here and ask Jalani about her evaluation. Further comments, Andy. So this is a torturous subject for me because I have to say, having been through this process a number of times, I was never a great fan of it to begin with. And so it sort of horrifies me that we're not seizing the opportunity as a new body to right off the bat think new in how we do it. On the other hand, it's a little late now, and I think we do need to come up with a process and to be guided to as much as possible by the former process probably makes sense. 
So I started to think about what are the things about the, for, the process that really bothered me the most, why I had such a negative feeling about it. One was the length of the form that we were um, filling out and the complexity of the form. Um, and I had an advantage as a select board member because a lot of the topics that were on there that are gonna be totally unfamiliar to many of you as you look at were things we talked about because we did have a different role as a select board. Um, the second thing um, that I really didn't like um, was of course that it um, took a lot of time in my summer, but then I can't do anything about that. Um, but the third one is the, what we were talking about with the meeting where we all read. And um, to give you my experience with that, in the first meeting, I tried very hard to read um, four other evaluations and the composite evaluation and be conscientious about it. Um, by the second year, I realized that that was not something that was humanly possible for me in any amount of time. And you feel even more pressure doing it when there's a live television camera showing you just <laughs> reading. It is really, you, you become very conscious of that. Um, so um, that is a big problem. What I was doing more towards the end, and I actually think that it was fairly effective, is I was reading the composite first and seeing if the composite made sense and was coinciding with where I had knew my comments had gone. And then I would spend my time <clears throat> reading specific comments from my colleagues on the select board about the issues that, um, where I was seeing some difference to see if I could get an idea of where the difference was falling from between me and the composite. If I was agreeing with the composite, I didn't spend as much time with it. Um, so I'd have two suggestions to how to stick with the process as much as possible, but to uh, think about doing differently. One is to revisit the idea of doing this on live television, but instead, doing something that I actually had asked the select board to do and they rejected, so I'll ask the council to do it and you can re reject it too, and that is uh, to give out the information to read early in the evening with the understanding that there would be no discussion whatsoever in the live television which said started a specific preset time in which the meeting was announced and then we would begin with an explanation of what had happened to that time. It does take a little bit of the pressure off from you having to sit there and read and knowing that the television camera is showing you doing something particularly boring. And it actually was even more awkward for the select board, and might be for this group too, because the tradition was that uh, the um, town, which I always thought could be construed as bribe, I suppose, was buying pizza for us so that we would actually be sitting there eating pizza on live television, <laughs> reading these things. Um, so then the, the other thing though that I'm very serious about is I really would encourage all of you before we vote on this to take a look at that form. Say, is this the right form for us as a council? Mm. And should we charge the president with proposing a different form based upon a discussion which we might have as a group and then uh, having the discussion and vote on whether to adopt a form that um, the president might propose to us. So those are my, ultimately my two suggestions after sharing my horrifying experiences, horrifying to me anyway, maybe not to you, but one is to not do the live television reading, but start the television later. And the second is to consider asking the president to do a revised form. Thank you for your patience. I have a question, I have a question of Margaret. Can people show up and do reading without calling a meeting? No, the council shouldn't do that. However, isn't there a provision in the new rules of procedure that would allow for a um, work session 
um, that you might be able to call and actually just have quiet reading during that work session before a meeting? Yes. But we still have to call a meeting. You still have to call a meeting. And do we have to have it televised at that point? You do not need to have it televised. Yes. I mean, of course, if somebody wants to sit and look for, you know, three hours to watch us read, that's, you know, that's like right. watching wallpaper right, dry. It, it would be a work session where we're not taking any votes. Right. I mean, that's the way we okay. wrote it. Yeah. All right. Then we have the meeting after the work session. All right. Um, Kathy, you had a question. Um, it was a comment on, on Andy's. I, when I looked at this form, the evaluation form, my first reaction was I wanted to edit it and get it much more focused. Um, you know, I've been in other organizations where we've done evaluations. I've never seen anything that went on as long as this one did um, at the level of minutia that this one did. You know, I mean, you know, there's some big topics in it, so I'm not saying it's all minutia. It's just, you know, it, it, it didn't, and it led me to think that when I wanted to talk about larger topics, I would have to search for the place to do it because I had to, you know, there was the small things, you know, one, what was uh, sent in a public works proposal for the North Amherst intersection was one of the things, and I know that happened. You know, so that was my example of something, an action that happened, but I wanted to get it more focused on some larger issues. Um, so if there is a, would it be a way of doing it, it would save us time in terms of skipping things, but it would also open up more space where we could be writing a sentence or two if we had more to say. Additional comments, Kathy? Yes. Um, at, at one point you said um, being able to ask, I think you're using Shalini as an example, about her opinion. It was you or Andy said it. So I understand that we sit and we read silently. Are we able to then ask the person, say, here you said this, what do you mean? Are we allowed to talk to them? Yes, you are. Okay, then that does sound like a work session. That, but at that point, it now becomes a public, a, you know, the TV's now on and it's a public session. So if you talk, it's yes. Andy. Just for clarification or for information, I do not recall that we ever did that on the select board where we quizzed each other about their particular evaluations. You might recall from it because you were on it longer than me. Yes, I was. Alyssa. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few years longer. And yes, it did vary over the years. But um, in terms of you, ha you basically have to make a note to yourself. And then once everyone's done reading and the president's opened it up to discussion, that would be the time to say, I read three people said something about this and I don't even know what that means. You wanna tell me more about that? But it would have to, and that's why we can't really get any other business done that night. In terms of the form, I, I'm not pretending the form's pretty, but I'm really concerned about the idea of saying, I wanna talk about bigger picture issues. These are the goals. You don't get to talk about bigger picture issues. You're, you're rating him based on his goals, but, but, there is space at the end to talk about right. other things that you want to talk about. Yeah, I, and I, so it's a, it, it is, it, it's only unpretty because we made too long of goals. <laughs> and I, then I, we I did understand those goals those, but I think you this. could consolidate a few of them. But, but they are the, the goals. The, and so you would have to wordsmith yeah. them to an agreement that that's what the goal, that that's what it represents. The, and this was what we wordsmithed. To this the, point. the reality is these are the goals that the select board approved with the town manager and these are the goals to which he has been working this year and that's what he will write his self-assessment to so changing you we can't change the goals however I want to build on something Andy suggested and something Alyssa just alluded to and that is in the comment section on the back, I would, I would actually, and I, this is where I might add some things, something like, please find attached the draft of the council goals that we have been discussing, um, and you might talk about the extent, the ways in which the town manager has supported 
the achievement of those goals, that kind of thing. But the reality is when you establish some goals in public with a person and that is what you say they're going to be evaluated on, that's what they get evaluated on. You can't change it midstream. Mandy Jo. So I, I found the form long. Um, I understand that those are the goals, even though we didn't set them, that we have to evaluate the manager on this year. Um, but. I wonder if there is a better way to organize them as Kathy and Andy were suggesting and maybe that better way is to somehow figure out how they fit into the charter defined duties of the town manager. There's a list of A to, I don't, I think we ended up with like a BB or something or a CC. I, I don't, I think we went past Z, but maybe not. Maybe we ended up at like X. Um, and I don't know whether that's possible but maybe that's a way where you could group the goals into sort of these goals fell under negotiating contracts. These goals fell under this duty and ability, you know, authority of the town manager, and these fell under this one so that maybe you don't have to evaluate on every specific. You could have an overall, whatever that section is in the charter, accomplished, not, whatever those items are, um, with here's the four things under that thing he was supposed to do this year. And maybe that would help it be a little more understandable, a little more readable. It's just an idea. So one of the options would be to add another column and in that column list the section of the charter that it relates to. However, I just want to point out that the people that set these goals were not functioning under the charter. They, they actually were functioning were. under the select board rules. The charter was adopted a year, over a year but ago. But they were so. not governing under the charter. They had some restrictions and that was it. So um, let me suggest the following because I do want to try to help people move along with the meeting. That I would add a column where I relate to the extent possible where one of these might fit under the numerous town manager responsibilities that are in the charter. Um, that might help us actually as we translate to next year. That I would also then add at the end reference to the draft goals, which by the way we've not adopted, um, that the council has been working on and specifically ask you to comment on those as we um, move forward. And just be very straightforward and say, if you don't feel that you are, un if you feel you are unable to judge, just say so. You're just unable to judge. Don't, there's no more comment needed. That was my question. Can you leave things blank? Absolutely. Because I, I just get so check annoyed when I'm judge. asked too many questions about something. Yeah. I end up just not wanting to play. Yeah. Just check unable to judge. And the composite might show that there were 11 or 12 people or even 13 unable to judge because that's the composite is the composite of the ratings here and then the cover memo is the themes that's what's been done in do the we past. get these as an excel spreadsheet or as an interactive something this is an excel spreadsheet no actually this is a it's a document that you can put your own uh it's a word document but that it's we'll, a we'll be able to fill oh yeah absolutely oh yeah Absolutely, Dorothy. Darcy. Darcy, I'm sorry. <laughs> Never, oh my God, now you've really confused me. Dorothy. Um, so uh, I'm on OCA and I just wanted to add this one comment that I mentioned this morning. I, I um, you know, will, am voting for this because it's another one-off um, and we're like in OCA I especially am are, uh, extremely appreciative that the president worked with Alyssa and Andy to try to come up with this process because OCO was, you know, we're, we have are now backed up with a lot of different issues around appointments that are coming through. Um, but I, I would really like us to um, uh, consider in the future having OCA be involved in this process because it's in our charge and we, and it makes sense to me 
uh, as representatives of the council, which in the charter, the, it's the town council has the responsibility for evaluating the town manager. Um, I think in this year, you know, the council president has taken that on, uh, but in future years, it makes sense to me for the town council do it to do it via OCA in whatever way we decide we're going to do it once we have finalized our goals and so on, um, set up and possibly use the process that Mandy Jo suggested, which makes a lot of sense using the criteria and the charter. It's a discussion for the future not to be settled tonight. Mandy Jo. So could I just get a response on why the August 5th meeting has been canceled if we're going to spend the three other six weeks of meetings essentially doing only it was town manager evaluation stuff? Two th you can go ahead and have the August 5th meeting. I was also looking for a way to give the council a break. I'm not going to be here. I'm not here. I it may violate the Geneva Convention as well. <laughs> But to have, that was the only reason. Otherwise, we can go ahead and have it, and just people can either participate remotely or um, whatever. But it was the attempt to try to give people a break, mm. since I've been hearing a lot of people saying they need a break. Is it, is it just Shalini and Dorothy that can't make it? I, I can come. I'll I can participate remotely. remotely. I can participate remotely. I'm sorry? I can participate remotely. And will I, as will I. So, Andy? So I just want to point out that what we did also is you added an August 26th meeting and some of us planned vacations for that week knowing that there wasn't going to be a council meeting. And that's fine too. <laughs> uh, the The problem will be is we won't be ready for the 5th to do all of the uh, things. It would be a regular meeting if we need it. Yes? I just want to say that in the OCA discussion this morning, uh, the president did offer to provide pizza for that reading <laughs> session. And I want to make sure that that's uh, in the minutes. Right. <laughs> Thank you. That's to make sure you don't feel like you're being bribed by the town manager. Um, I guess the question before us is whether or not we are going to vote this calendar and it does not need to include the August 5th cancellation. But at this point, that doesn't figure into this particular set of activities anyway. And there's no way that, given everything that has to happen, that by August 5th, um, the evaluations and the drafts will be ready. I move that we approve this timeline because we have to get started in order to accomplish the goal. Is there a second? Would you um, be removing the Monday, August 5th line, though, from this? Would we be removing what? Would you be taking away the August 5th? The timeline currently shows Monday, August 5th, yeah, no but it has, The August 5th meeting has nothing to do with the actual yeah. timeline, timeline for so the process. That's so that's a separate discussion. Alyssa. Could I just quickly add that should, could we ensure that the motion says Town manager performance evaluation, those words in okay. that order. So it's to prove the timeline manager is recommended by OCA for evaluation of the town manager. Yeah, not that. Town manager performance evaluation. Okay. I need to be able to Google things from year to year. <laughs> town manager performance evaluation is what he calls it on his self-evaluation. It's not so evaluation the evaluation of the town excuse manager. Excuse me. So the motion would read to approve the timeline as recommended by OCA for the town manager performance evaluation. Is there a motion? Yes. 
Okay. And second? It's been amended, friendly amendment, accepted. Yes. Oh, okay. So Dorothy made the motion and Alyssa seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Nay. Okay, it's una and abstain. Unanimous 12. One absent. All right, we're moving on to the appointments. And the first one is ranked choice voting. And I believe that Evan, you're going to do this, right? Slap. Do you want to go through the process again? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so Oka is back with more appointments for y'all. Um, and so we have uh, appointments to Ranked Choice Voting Commission and Participatory Budgeting Commission. And I want to first talk about the process because last time we talked a lot about the process and this process is similar but different. Um, so if you could go. So this looks really, really messy and I know. And the reason it looks messy is that Ranked Choice Voting Commission and Participatory Budgeting Commission, as you all know, are weird bodies that have joint appointing authority. And so Ranked Choice Voting has three appointments from the council, three from the town manager. Participatory budgeting has two from the council, three from the town manager. And so the question that Oka had before us is, when you apply, you don't say, I want to apply to be a town manager appointee to Ranked Choice Voting. It's all one pool. And so it didn't necessarily make sense for us to, for an Oka designee to interview everyone and then the town, count, the town manager to interview everyone. It made sense to sort of have this joint interview to reflect the joint appointing authority. So what you see there is actually, even though it looks really messy, is the exact same diagram you saw last week for Planning Board and Zoning Board of Appeals, except it has sort of a parallel process that includes the town manager and shows um, that. So I'm just going to walk us through it. So applicants applied to the CAF pool. That went both to OCA and the town manager. Um, and then OCA selected a designee for ranked choice voting. I was the designee for participatory budgeting. The designee was George Ryan. Uh, the designee then worked with the town manager to schedule interviews. Uh, the interviews were the OCA designee and the town manager were required. And then per availability, a member of the resident advisory committee and the staff liaison. So in the ranked choice voting commission interviews, it was myself. Uh, the town manager, and then the town clerk who serves on the, on the Ranked Choice Voting Commission. In participatory budgeting, it was uh, Councillor Ryan, the town manager, uh, Sonia as the interim finance director, and a member of the resident advisory committee was able to be in those interviews. They were not able to be in the Ranked Choice Voting ones. So you see the dates those occurred. There was then a conversation between the town manager and the town councillor about you know, what we saw, and then sort of a dividing up of whose appointments were whose, uh, all of those information, uh, almost all of those recommendations came forward at the same time. And then OCA at its May 22nd meeting looked and voted at them and now we are ready for town council to act. And so it's, it's really the same process you saw last time except the town manager um, was not someone who was just being consulted, it was also someone who was actively interviewing and had a consulting role. Um, are there any questions about about the process that was used before we move forward. Mandy Jo. So this is more of a follow-up question. It, it's about all the processes. Um, in this one, since the town manager was also an appointing authority, the memos mentioned that the town manager and sometimes the town clerk, if the cl clerk was sitting in or the fi interim finance director, um, asked follow-up questions and all of that, but that the OCA designee never asked any follow-up questions, just those exact questions on that list. Could you give me um, some reasoning behind why the OCA designee cannot ask anything but what is on the list? Because uh, that seems really weird to me in an interview. Of course. So um, when OCA was deciding on this process way back when, not this one exactly, but sort of the overall process, um, there was a feeling uh, that I think was shared by many members of the council that the OCA designee had a lot of 
power, right? They were the sole person in the room. And so one of the things that Oka sought to do was to make sure that even though there was only one person in the room conducting the interviews, that Oka still had a lot of say in what happened in those interviews. And so uh, we, Oka came up with standard interview questions that were to be used and followed exactly um, so that Oka knew and had a say in what was being asked in those interviews. So if I was to, it, you know, the idea being um, that Oka wanted to know exactly and have input into what was happening in the interview, even though if we couldn't be there. So it, it was just it, a part of that sort of process we discussed last time of only being able to have one designee, but still having Oka feel like they had some control over what was happening. Um, but certainly the other members of the interview were allowed and did ask uh, their own questions. Other, other comments on the process? Okay. All right, then we're going so, to move along, and um, let me just, yes. Uh, I was, yeah, I was going to move along. Okay, I, I just want to point out, there are, for each of these committees, there'll be two votes. One will be the vote regarding the people recommended by OCA, and the other will be the vote of the people recommended by the town manager, but those have also been reviewed by OCA. Okay. I don't have a question, but as you go into your recommendations, can you tell us how many total there were in the pool as you lead into then who you're recommending? I, I read the memo, but I wasn't really sure whether you, you had like twice as many as what you're bringing, just um, the numbers. You received all of the applications. Right, I, I just didn't take time, you know, so I thought for, for one, we were one short of the total number of shots. I just didn't count them, Lynn, I just wanted the, to. For one of them, there is still an open position, yes. Right. Okay. Okay. Good. I think I can address this, yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah, sorry, I didn't realize it. So uh, I just want to point you back to, again, we keep providing you with this decision tree to help you and inform you. Um, the first two, again, are questions about the recommended appointees. The bottom two are questions about the applicant pool, which I think you're asking. Um, so for this, you know, we did make a note in the report of saying um, one of, for one of the commissions, there was a, a fairly um, sizable applicant pool. Um, for the other, uh, there was not. And so one of the things that OCA noted in its report is that uh, OCA needs to have a discussion going forward about when we decide an applicant pool is insufficient to move forward with appointment. Uh, the reason, and I want to make clear the reason we did not do so in this case, even though one of the committees did have a fairly sparse applicant pool, uh, is that per the charter, we need to seat these committees. Um, and so we sort of under a time crunch moved forward despite our answers to the questions of was the applicant pool sufficient probably would have been no in this case, um, but because we had a time constraint, we, had, we sort of had to move forward anyway. Uh, so for rank choice voting commission, since I was the OCA designee, I'll speak to this one. Uh, so I am recommending uh, as, that the town council appoint as town council appointments, uh, Tanya Lees, Jesse Crafts Finch, and John Bryan. In your report, you have uh, profiles about them that's written from their CAFs and from the interviews. Uh, you can also see the other town manager appointments. Um, as Lynn mentioned, those would be voted separately since we're confirming as opposed to appointing. Um, does anyone have questions about the people that I am putting forth, or that OCA is putting forth? Thank for you for that correction. Yeah. I recommended that OCA put forth, and they yeah. voted to put forth. Are there questions? For, I, I actually just am going to suggest that are there questions for either those being appointed by the uh, recommended to the town council appointments and versus the town manager appointments? Are there questions for any of these at this time? Okay, then uh, I would suggest, and this we're going to do a little wording on this. Uh, motion because we need to um, tell the committees when they would start, when they would have to complete, when they would have to uh, have things come to the council, and when they would be ending. So the first one is to appoint to the Ranked Choice Voting Commission under the Amherst Home Rule Charter, Section 10.10, .10, for terms commencing July 1st, 
2019. Tanya Lees, Jess Jesse Crafts Finch, and John Bryan, as recommended by the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee. Furthermore, their appointments would commence immediately. They would report back to the council by September 1st, 2020. And the council would act within 90 days, thus by November 2020. And the committee would cease to exist on December 1st, 2020. Is there a motion? No, did I get the dates wrong? I think you have the terms commencing at two different times. Oh, okay. Margaret, do you have it written down? Okay. Yeah, I would suggest just changing the motion where it says commencing July 1, 2019 to um, commencing immediately. Okay, thank you. Okay. So do you have the full motion, Margaret? Okay, if you could read it to us. The motion is to appoint to the Ranked Choice Voting Commission under the Amherst Home Rule Charter, Section 10.10, .10, for terms commencing immediately. Tanya Lease, Jesse Crafts Finch, and John Bryan, as recommended by the Outreach, Communications, and Appointments Committee. Furthermore, I'm going to I'm going to pass on the commencement. Um, the com commission would report back to the council by September 1, 2020. The council would act on the commission's recommendation within 90 days, and the terms of members would expire on December 31st. No, December 1st. I'm sorry, December 1st, 2020. Alyssa? That's what I had calculated based on the 90 days plus a day, because the 90 days ended on a Monday, which would probably okay. be a council meeting, and then Tuesday the next day. So I made the motion. Is that how we're recording it? And it was seconded by Alyssa. Further, yes, Mandy Jo. So I wonder if it's wise to put in the report back and then the dissolution dates. Um, the report back date is in the charter. It's already in the charge. So I don't know if we need to include it in this motion. But we might, the charge the charter doesn't require it be dissolved at any time. And depending on what we decide to do with their recommendations, mm -hmm. we might have more stuff for them to do, like actual acquiring of voting equipment um, and other potential things that I can't think of right now that we might not want mm -hmm. this commission mm -hmm. dissolved on December 1. We might not want to have to appoint new people to deal with something this group's already very familiar with. So I wonder if we should just, I think we should, I think we should just leave the dissolution open and do that when it's necessary then. And we could just say terms, most, most terms are two or three years, but um, you know, we could just leave it all open. So the way I personally like, even though it's in the charter and in the charge, to say in the motion that they would report by September 1st, 2020, and that the council act has to act in 90 days, and then just drop the last part. Yes. So I, I appreciate that I'm getting some agreement on repeating what's in the charter and charge, because the charge is whatever. The charter is true, but these motions have to stand on their own. We cannot expect people to go off and look and see what the charter says in section 10.10. .10. I also think it still makes sense. I, I, we don't appoint people. We've never previously, let's start doing something new. We've never previously appointed people to terms that don't end. So we pick an end date. Whether we pick an end date that we think I added on the 90 days plus one, 
There's no requirement that says if you say that their term ends on December 1st, 2020, that you don't decide in October or November or whenever that you want to ask those people to continue. That doesn't mean they get thrown out. That doesn't mean you have to start with new people. But I think it makes eminent sense when some of these people move away and need to be replaced, which they will, not all these people will stay on this committee, is that they know what the commitment is that they're signing up for and they shouldn't have to go read the charter to find that out. I think it should be really clear right up front what their commitment is. We should never have, and we won't have on any of our other things, no end date and just guesses associated with that. So I appreciate that we may want them to continue and that is something we've done plenty of times as appointing authorities in the past is said, now we need to continue because they're not done yet. Andy Joe. So the charge we passed says two years for term of appointment, so why don't we make it two years? That's what the charge says. There is no such thing as two years. There's a date that ends so, as so two years. So if it's a two-year term of appointment, we could make it, if it's going to commence immediately, we could say to end on June 3rd, 2021, which would comply with the charge. I'm okay with making a two-year appointment. I'm okay with leaving it open. Um, let's make it a two-year appointment end on June 3rd, 2021, and is, that's a friendly amendment. Is it accepted? Sure. All right. Could we have a reading of the motion the way it is? To appoint to the Ranked Choice Voting Commission under the Amherst Home Rule Charter, Section 10.10, .10 for terms commencing immediately. Tanya Lees, Jesse Crafts Finch, and John Bryan as recommended by the Outreach, Communications, and Appointments Committee. Furthermore, the Commission would report back to the Council by September 1, 2020. The Council would act within 90 days, and the terms uh, and the Commission's terms would expire June 3, 2021. Okay, is there further discussion? Yes, Mandy Jo. I hate to be particular, but um, the charter, if we're going to use the charter language, the charter says the council shall adopt within 90 days, not act. Okay, I accept that as a friendly amendment. Alyssa? Yeah, I didn't use the word, so. That's fine. Okay. Any further questions or points of order on this? Okay. Then... All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Unanimous? 12 with one absent. We're moving to the next one, which is to confirm the town manager's appointments to the Ranked Choice Voting Commission under the Amherst Home Rule Charter, Section 10.10 .10 and 2.11b for terms commencing immediately, Ellen Lindsay, Carol Rob Robertson, and Peggy Shannon, as recommended by the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee. Further, they will report to the Town Council by September 1st, 2020, and the Council will adopt their recommendations within 90 days and their terms will expire on June 3rd, 2021. Okay. Any further discussion on this? Okay. Then all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain, unanimous, 12 uh, when absent. Okay, we're moving on to Participatory Budgeting Commission. George? Yeah, uh, mine was the, uh, the body that uh, did not have a large pool. In fact, it was one short. Um, and so at the moment, we're actually still looking for one more member, but we felt that it was important to move forward. Um, I still felt uh, the candidates were strong. Um, in the best of all possible worlds, it would have been nice to have a large pool, but um, um, I felt the candidates were strong. I also thought the process went well. Um, so uh, you have in front of you the names, 
Meg Gage, Elizabeth Larson, that um, I'm recommending, or the OCA, excuse me, is recommending uh, as town council appointees. And um, I'd be had to entertain any questions, but that's uh, in the report. Um, Discussion? And this, by the way, is the one of the committees to which the council already has an appointee, and that appointee is Kathy Shane. Okay. And the empty seat still remains to be filled, and that is an appointment of the town manager. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Then the motion is to appoint to the Participatory Budgeting Commission under Amherst Home Rule Charter Section 10.11 for terms commencing immediately, Meg Gage and Elizabeth Larson as recommended for by the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee. Further, they will report back to the Council by December 1, 2020, and the Council will adopt measure, act, act I'm sorry, will act. By within 90 days, and the appointments will end on June 3rd, 2021. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Um, any further discussion? I just want to say that, uh, at least in my conversations with these people, they will be a little surprised by this end date. Um, they, I think, thought that their time would end um, in within the December date. Um, so I guess we'll explain it to them. And George, if they get done even before that, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And thanks for your work, as well as Evan, for your work on this. Kathy? So I, I just wanted to uh, build a comment on what George just said. So. If they do make a proposal by this date and we act on it, that's the end of it, yes. If the question would be is if it's, it's a lingering discussion, that then, it, then they continue. Yeah, we would call them back, but otherwise we can dissolve the committee early. Okay. So I think that would be the way you would, we would be explaining it to people. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> that we use the two-year term for the charter. Is there any further discussion on this? The motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? 12-0, one absent. Okay, then finally it's to confirm the town manager's appointments to the participatory budgeting commission under Amherst Home Rule Charter Section 10.11 for terms commencing immediately. John Fensk, Fenske? and John Page, as recommended by the Outreach Communication and Appointments Committee. They will report back to the council by December 1st, 2020, and the council will act within 90 days, and their terms will end June 3rd, 2021. Is there a second? Second. Well, I had several, thank you. Pat, Pat got the second in on that one. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. And abstain? None. 12 0, 1 absent. Okay. Oh, we have one other set of appointments tonight. And. Um, leisure services. Um, these are appointments made by the town manager. They've been reviewed by OCA. Is there anyone on OCA who would like to speak to the motion? Yes, Evan. So OCA uh, voted these on May 22nd in that special meeting where we also considered RCV and PBC. Um, we had received the memo several days before, um, and we voted 4-0 with one absent to recommend the town council approve uh, the names and terms outlined in the town manager's memo. Uh, I do want to note that there was a conversation uh, that OCA had in this process about um, 
two aspects of our OCA review of town manager appointments. Um, one had to do with information provided in the memos. Uh, so if you look, uh, there are five people being, five, four people being recommended. Uh, two are already on the committee. Uh, the two who are new members have written profiles. The two who are not, just as they serve on the committee. Um, and OCA did feel as though we would like uh, a little bit more information other than this person is already on this committee um, and to see written profiles. Uh, OCA, uh, OCA also had a discussion about um, in the future hoping that the town manager, uh, this would take some schedule and could participate in OCA's when we do vote on town manager appointments um, because for this instance, and we gave him no notice we were going to do this, so I'm, I'm not putting any blame on anyone. Um, but if we had a question, uh, the town manager wasn't present to field them. So OCA is continuously thinking about how we're doing this process and, and two of the things that came out of this discussion were uh, what, what information we want and looking for equal information from incumbents versus non-incumbents and also requesting that the, uh, we work with the town manager so that he's present uh, when we review them so that if we do have questions, uh, he's there to field them. Okay, any questions at this time? Okay, then the motion is, and I'd like someone to make the motion, it's to confirm the ta town manager's appointments to the Leisure Services and Supplemental Education Commission under Amherst Home Rule Char Charter Section 211B for a three-year term commencing immediately upon confirmation. Stephanie Jackson for a three-year term commencing July 1st, 2019. Victor Nunez-Ortiz for a three-year term of reappointment commencing July 1st, 2019, Sarah Marshall, all whose terms shall expire June 3rd, 30th, 2022, and for a two-year term, for a, for two-year terms of reappointment commencing July 1st, 2019, Rebecca Demling and Meg Rosa, whose term shall expire June 30th, 2021, as recommended by the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee. Is there a second? No, actually, I want a motion. I so move. Pam, Dorothy Pam moved. Second, Alyssa. Any further discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. George was a second. Okay, now, problem with the motion? Problem with the motion, so it doesn't follow the old way. It's select board used to do things, which is fine. You can do things however you want, but it's confusing, and I think partly because the way it's structured is why we're missing Sarah Marshall's term. It, it, it's just, her name's just thrown in the middle here without an explanation of how her term works. So it talks about Stephanie Jackson for a three-year term commencing July 1. Victor Nunez Ortiz for a three year term commencing appointment, reappointment commencing July 1, and then it just says Sarah Marshall. <laughs> so I think what it means to say is based on the memo, is Sarah Marshall is a re and, and Victor isn't a reappointment. So the, Victor's not a reappointment. They're, they're all there, it's just the clauses before the name. For a three-year term commencing Which immediately, is why this Stephanie is Jackson, so semicolon. Oddly. For a three-year term commencing, Victor Nunez-Ortiz, semicolon. The clause Which, is before the name. Which is why we'll never write it this way again, because this, this just does not work. No, it doesn't. Bullet points are fine. Yes. It's all in there, then I, I see that I don't ever want to see one structured that way again, but I see that it's in there. Are there any further comments or questions? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? 12 nothing. 12 zero, excuse me, one absent. We're moving on to approval of minutes. I've consulted with the clerk in advance. We can do this as a consensus vote. Um, so it's to approve the May 15, May 20, May 21, and May 23, 2019. Why, is that all of them? I, okay, all right, let me start over. To approve the May 15, May 20, May 21, and May 23, 2019 Town Council meeting minutes as presented. 
Is there a motion? George, is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion on any of these I corrections on I I just any have, of them? I have a correction I already sent in, but I didn't see it on the one that's still online, so I'm assuming it just, it, it was a minor one. It just had me both absent and present at a meeting. And I, so I, yeah, I thought it was a, a Maybe good show here. of, <laughs> but, I, but I, you know, I'm assuming that already got taken, will get taken care of. Okay. Thank you. Any further conversation on this? Okay. Let's see. None. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose? You may vote even though you were not at a meeting. That's fine. Okay. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Abstain? We have two abstentions. So it's 10 0 2 in favor. All right. We are moving on to <laughs> committee reports. Nothing from audit, Pat? Not until August. Okay. Bylaw review? Same old, same old as I've said before. Okay. Although we do have some so, zoning uh, bylaws coming up. On the 17th, but it's, and, but it's for referral to the planning board. The planning board. Zoning board. Zoning board, I'm sorry. No, the zoning yeah. subcommittee of the planning board. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. <laughs> Some of it's true. Okay. So, so June 17th. So, yes. bylaw review has completed its review of the zoning bylaw. Uh, it was introduced, I believe, to the Zoning Subcommittee on May 29th. I believe the Planning Board of Falls, going according to plan, shall be holding their public hearing on it on June 5th. That means that we will have our first read of it on June 17th, okay. and then ideally second reading and vote on July 1. Okay. Margaret, question? No. Okay. Um, and so... Thank you for that. No, no that, thanks. <laughs> Community Resources Committee. We have not met since the last council meeting. Okay. We, we meet on Wednesday, this Wednesday, 2.30. Uh, council Goals Ad Hoc Committee. Um, that is still in business. Uh, we're waiting for some committees to get their different goals back to us, uh, but we have received it from some others. I'll be back in touch. Finance Committee, Andy, anything else? Uh, just real quickly, the next three meetings are June 11 at 9.30 a.m. to discuss budget amendments on the FY19 budget and uh, JCPC um, discussion on the proposed process and the, the uh, further possi possibly the further review of the uh, analytical tool that we had looked at for major projects June 25 at 9.30. Um, is to discuss the Valley CDC CPA proposal to, on the financial considerations and uh, as we postponed action until after the uh, discussion that's been organized by the president and then July 23rd to begin the discussion about the uh, next year's budget process. Okay, thank you. Um, GOL? And did you? Nothing to add to the report for now. Okay. Outreach communications. Oka, anything? Yes. I want to go back one moment to bylaw review and just add to the wonderful reports that Pat and Evan gave that you will have in your town council packet for June 17th, the planning board's report on their hearing. So you'll have that to read ahead of time. Okay. The other thing is in regards to OCA, just to update you, um, an OCA designee is doing the finance committee non-voting resident interviews this week and we expect to be able to get something to the council for the meeting on the 17th. Correct. Correct. No. 
July 1. We're actually not going to be able to bring those forward till July 1. We're going to have some other ones for June 17th, but we won't be able to do, we worked on our timeline today, and we won't be able to get those to you until July, for July 1, although you may get them a little bit before July 1. And the other thing that's an update beyond all the things you already heard from us tonight is that we asked via Angela Mills, who was present for part of our meeting, that the Resident Advisory Committee come to the June 10th OCA meeting, since it's on TV and that's our standard meeting, because some of us meet every single week, CRC, looking at you, and um, to discuss a number of our shared concerns and challenges, right? So as we see these things coming forth through the town manager and through OCA, and we all know we're gonna be re-looking at the OCA process anyway, what are some different questions we have, just like Evan brought up earlier, associated with when you write biographies, do you write a little biographical statement or statement about the person if they're continuing to serve, or do you, do you just say they continue to serve? That's something we can talk about with each other. Of course, the town manager can still do what he wants to do with his things, but just to have a shared conversation. The other thing that we've also recognized is that as the process currently stands, based on the way staff is managing interviews, we have had no opportunity as OCA to decide whether or not a pool is sufficient to schedule interviews or to consider making appointments. We've just been told when the appointments will be, when the interview appointments will be. And so we're realizing, these are things that you know develop over time that you realize are wait, things you might want to address because you might want, not want to start interviewing people if you only have half as many as your applicants. So we'll discuss that with RIC because they will obviously be struggling with some of the same things. And also the fact that we have, all, we have up until this point interviewed people who are currently serving who wish to be reappointed. The town manager is not doing that right now. And so again, it's, you know, he does what he does, but just for us to kind of bounce ideas off of each other as to why we might do things a certain way would be helpful. So we're hoping that'll happen next week. Um, I just want to say in defense of CRC, we canceled our meeting because of a conflict with the panel on economic develop, which, development, which had been rescheduled. And so it was felt that since de economic development is part of our charge, that we should be there. And I certainly was there. All right. Having now taken things out of order, we're moving on to, do, to number 11, town manager's report. Thank you. A um, few things I'd like to report on. Cup of Joe's coming up on June 14th. We'll be in North Amherst at Jake's at the Mill. It seems to be the most popular place to have coffees by anybody from North Amherst. Um, our community participation officers, I gave them a shout out last time. They continue to be working very hard, going to lots of events where people are already gathering to pass the word. Uh, and I really appreciate the hard work they're doing because those events happen on weekends and they're taking weekends away from their fam time away from their families to go to these things because they really believe in their mission, which I really think is a ter terrific thing. Um, we had our employee picnic on Friday and that's why you saw the town hall was closed at noon. This is an event that the employees organize, that the employees pay for. It's, uh, and it's a terrific event because it, it really is the one half day a year that all the employees from all the different departments get to be together uh, and, and hang out and have uh, barbecue and things like that. Uh, actively recruiting for uh, several positions and that work is moving forward. The uh, road work is nearing completion on West Bay Road and East Pleasant Street. I think there's some lines that still need to be painted. They've started up work on Main Street uh, today because we had held them off during the um, uh, April and May period where the uh, local business owner said was their most important months. Um, the challenge for a lot of road work now is finding police officers. So if they can't find police mm -hmm. officers, they have to make other arrangements. Uh, they reach to our police force, to state police, to local police officers. Uh, I guess a lot of police officers are working a lot of overtime already, and if they can't get a detail, they uh, make some other arrangements. Um, the LSSC is working uh, very uh, well with the university over preparing for their Independence Day fireworks celebration. Uh, this will be in a slightly different location because of construction at the university, but they've been really cooperative on this. Uh, you'll notice on, uh, don't, don't, on page two that uh, under the uh, action taken last month by the um, council, this is the first monthly report on delegated authority on short-term event use of town commons, short-term parking requests, and short-term road or sidewalk closures. And we'll, I'll continue to do that on a monthly basis. 
Um, the station road bridge has been delivered. Uh, the, the station, the existing station road bridge is being deconstructed and uh, hopefully in the next couple weeks we will continue to be installing that station, the new station road bridge which, which is sitting on the side of the road. Um, the Mill Street Bridge, you're all invited to a ribbon cutting tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. to officially uh, receive the bridge from the state who paid for it and constructed it. And um, with that turnover, the town will be able to go in and make some uh, permanent changes to make it clear where you can drive, where you can't drive, where the, where, you, where the walking path is. The concept has been to create a safe walking path around Puffer's Pond, and this will be a key part of that. And lastly, uh, the president already alluded to it, I'm sad to report that our town clerk has submitted her resignation effective June 30th. She's also the clerk to the council, so that's a, a position that council will be seeking to fill. And um, I think Margaret has uh, done yeoman's work. There's, I don't think there's anybody who could have carried the weight of being both town clerk, clerk to the council, chief elections officer, all at the same time. She was an unusual person. We're really fortunate to have her for the time that we have. Um, sad to see her go, and, uh, but understand her reasoning. And um, so we will be looking for a new town clerk. That concludes my report. Okay. Pat. I know we had agreed, and I was one of the people who pushed it, that we wouldn't applaud. Uh, but I think we owe this woman a round of applause. I was going to suggest we would embarrass her more at a future time. <laughs> Mandy Jo. Excuse me, that's I just have rose. one question. Um, and one of your first bullet points, you referred to an eighth grader in Amherst who wrote an article or an essay in an essay contest and got third place. Where can we find that essay that was titled? Oh, yeah. Is it there? Yeah, it's attached to the report. Yeah. I, I scrolled all the way through and it didn't, it didn't show it, up, so I'll have to. Smeared. Couldn't read it. Yeah. I don't know. I'll have to look again. I, I made it to the end and it didn't. Okay. We'll find I'll relook. Alyssa? Can we add to our next agenda what's uh, so? Margaret's been amazing and wonderful, and we were grateful that when Paul hired her, we knew we weren't, none of us were elected yet, but we knew mm -hmm. that he was going to ask her to be clerk of the council. I think now we're at a point where we should have some say in mm -hmm. who the clerk of the council is and whether or not that's automatically assumed to be part of the town clerk's duties or not based on budget limitations, obviously. But when do we get to have that conversation or does the town manager just go hire a new clerk and yeah. we just say, okay, we get part of them? Uh, first of all, Tom, Paul and I will be discussing this on right. Wednesday. And I hope to bring forward a recommendation to the council at our next meeting. Okay. If not, soon after that or an interim basis. Okay. Yes, Dorothy. Um, I am curious to know what Margaret thinks about this. Um, the double duty that you were put into, um, you are very uh, experienced and came with more background than, say, somebody, the next person might come with. We don't know but certainly a lot of background. Do you think it's doable for some person you don't know to do the two jobs? Um, with, with all due respect, I'd prefer not to comment on that and leave that to the town manager and the town council to decide. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'd like to move on to the town council comments. I have no additional comments to re well, I do actually. So we're moving along with our plans for June 18th. Uh, there is a, we have, um, have a proposal before us from Nancy Jackson, who is a skilled facilitator, and that has been sent to the town council, I mean to the town, uh, since they will be retaining her. This is a moment when we, like with the schools, will be listening 
and the format is in general going to be what they call a fishbowl, where you have an inner circle and outer circles. The inner circle will have representatives of housing, C Valley CDC, the neighborhood, and the town, and an empty chair. And the empty chair is for other people who then come in and add comments or questions so that there is room for additional participation. The plan is to be no, there for no more than two hours, and there will be material provided in advance. We're working as fast as we can. Pat. Yeah, I understand the importance of the empty chair, uh, but it seems like um, who are we at? Who represents the neighborhood? Only someone opposed to it or somebody for it? I, I think there's a funny kind of glitch there. I, I, hear, I hear your point. Uh, I actually have been, in fact, George got an email from me because as much as I have been trying to get a set of email addresses for this neighborhood, uh, I haven't received that, but I would like them to at least identify two people and then also we'll look for others as well and encourage them to come sit on the empty chair. Because we have gotten, as we know, letters both pro right. and con right. and from I'm the neighborhood. Yeah. Yes. I, I just want to comment here. Um, the only email addresses I have is if somebody sent me a letter. Um, certainly, um, almost everybody's letter does include their address. Yeah, no, I, Some don't, but yeah. I've, there's quite a variety of opinions expressed in the letters. Right. So, but I think, I don't think I have any email addresses that you don't, but I, I'll double I, I check I think I you. can find them from what I have. I just literally didn't get to that today in preparation for the meeting. Yeah, right. We'll, we'll manage that, okay. Uh, any other uh, future agenda items at this point? Yes. On which one? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. So, so I just, right, I didn't know if we were on C or if we were just long. Please. Um, I just wanted to, to recognize, because it's not in the manager's report and it's not in any of these lists of dates, uh, last Wednesday, uh, April 29th, I attended one of the uh, two scheduled community gatherings uh, around climate change vulnerabilities, which is part of the municipal vulnerability grant uh, program grant that our sustainability coordinator, Stephanie Ciccarello, is um, coordinating. So the first one was last Wednesday. I went. It was... Um, a very interesting meeting because I walked in and I didn't know anyone there, and that almost never happens with meetings I go to nowadays. Um, Stephanie put a tremendous amount of effort in into trying to make sure uh, that there were new people, that it was diverse. It was the most diverse meeting I've been in in my role as a counselor in Amherst. Uh, she did a lot of things to make that happen, everything from making sure it was on a bus line to providing childcare, providing a meal. Um, I think there were a lot of lessons there that members of the council and OCA can take on, um, you know, how we can make sure that our meetings aren't just always the same people. Uh, there were a lot of people coming up to her after saying, I've never done anything with the town before, and I wouldn't have unless, and, you know. Um, but there's a, the second one is scheduled for this Saturday um, at 9 a.m. in Crocker Farm. I won't be able to be in attendance. I'll be out of the, the state. Um, but for anyone who has that time free, uh, I, I went and it was really great. And I did something that I almost never do in meetings that you all know. And it, it, I didn't talk at all. I don't um, believe it. I, I promise. I didn't say a word. And I just listened. And it was just really great to hear from people who we don't usually hear from and to, and to hear them talk about climate change and vulnerability. Um, so I both want to thank Stephanie for the effort she put into that because um, I think it was successful and also encourage everyone, if you're available, to go to the, the June 8th meeting at Crocker Farm. Thank you. Are there other comments? What, what time is it? Nine minutes? o'clock. Other comments at this time? Yes, Dorothy. Um, I think if we had some food at the meeting on the 18th, it would be nice. Make it a little friendlier. 
Nothing's going to make it friendly. I mean, I don't think we want a Oh, I don't think that's true. Uh, I, I think if we, I think food makes a meeting different. Let me take that into consideration and see what we can do. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any further conversation? Any comments? We have no executive session. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Amy Andy Joe said so moved. Andy seconded it. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that was unanimous. Excuse me. Opposed. Abstain. Unanimous. Thank you.